Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the uh, this is the um, workshop session of ICRA 2020 on social robotics from neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, a big uh, hello from the from the organizers. It's uh, me, Salvatore Anzalone from uh, University Party 8, and uh, Hang Long Tao from Brussels. Uh, Mohamed Setouni uh, from uh, Sorbonne Université and Christine Datenan from uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here because, uh, I mean, I, I can imagine the... Uh, uh, I can imagine in these difficult times, it was very difficult to... <laughs> sorry for the repetition, it was very really difficult to reorganize uh, all the... Uh, all this workshop, the, all this workshop, all this event in an online event, and I am happy actually that we were able to to do it uh, one month ago, maybe twenty days ago. It seemed so something ultra difficult, but now we are there, and we are happy, and uh, I hope we will be able to do something cool together. Uh, so we are still waiting for uh, for David Cohen, our main our first uh, invited speaker uh, so let me just uh, do a small uh, uh, resume of uh, uh, what we will talk about today today we will talk about uh, robotics for neurodevelopmental deficits uh, so autism dyspraxia uh, and uh, attention coordination disorders, this kind of deficit. And uh, I think uh, um, cool. the, the, approach, the, the approach that we share uh, is maybe common, is this idea of uh, uh, using robots uh, uh, on one side to understand humans uh, through the understanding, of, the understanding of humans, try to make better robots. So, um, this is a field that I really, I really uh, like. It's uh, like my colleague, like the other organizers, are a bunch of years that we work on uh, on this topic, on this subject, and um, and what I really appreciate of it is the the possibility of uh, uh, propose a technological and scientific advances from not just uh, uh, robotics, but also uh, becoming kind of tool for say something more about uh, about humans, about the human development. Uh, also something that I really like of this, uh, of this field, for, it's the idea of having a real, uh, a real, uh, uh, real scenarios in which uh, we can uh, make real impact. Um, so I think this is the this is a, I think a common uh, uh, a common point of view we share on uh, on the on this particular use of uh, robotics. Uh, so uh, today we will have a very full day. Uh, I mean we will have two hours and half. I think uh, David is here. Yeah, we have uh, two, hours, two hours and a half of uh, spending together uh, talking about uh, this subject. Uh, we will have uh, uh, two invited speakers, David Cohen, that is uh, a medician, a doctor, and uh, at uh, the University uh, the Hospital uh, de la de Pitié Salpetrier uh, in Paris. And, uh, and uh, um, we have a, a, another. Uh, we have a, a robotician, uh, Brans Casellati, uh, and this the choice of these two speakers actually confirmed the multidisciplinary approach we are trying to follow. On one side, uh, a psychiatrist, and the other side, uh, 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 an engineer. Um, uh, we have these two main speakers, uh, but we this the 
discussion will evolve also then in a, a session which we will have the opportunity uh, to have uh, two special guests, uh, Aida Nazari from uh, Luxai, that is a company that uh, produce robots specific, uh, specifically developed for, uh, uh, neuro, for, for neurodevelopmental deficits, and uh, Chastigius from, uh, from Paris 8, uh, that is a trap psychologist. Uh, we will have also several contributions. Obviously, obviously we didn't we, we uh, didn't want to have uh, um, so sorry, turn off your microphones. <laughs> um, obviously, um, uh, we refrain to have uh, uh, too much longer uh, event uh, via virtual event. Um, so instead of having full presentations of, uh, uh, of the contributions, we'll have some, some kind of trailers and uh, you will be able to, to see the full uh, presentations and the PDF on the website and also on uh, the YouTube uh, channel we made for this special event uh, and also for in the iTriboli TV. Uh, we will uh, we have a, a special a special page for this. Uh, in for the people that uh, uh, maybe have problems with uh, with the stream on Zoom, uh, we the, the stream is also is also forwarded uh, to to YouTube and uh, to iTriple TV. You will be able to access to the uh, to the streams uh, from the website uh, of the of the workshop. Uh, you have all the link there. Uh, and actually there is also, uh, if you want, there is also um, a Slack page uh, for the people that <coughs> actually registered to, I, um, to ICRA 2020. And um, uh, just since uh, uh, for this last platform, since we will have a, a kind of delay between uh, um, the, the stream and uh, and the reality, uh, I would like to ask you if you have questions uh, to try to write them in the commentaries uh, uh, in the commentaries during the presentation. So then I can be, I will be able, we will be able to collect them and uh, and eventually ask uh, to the to the speaker. Uh, so the first the first uh, um, the first uh, talk. Uh, will be about uh, um, robotics and developmental disorder, neurodevelopmental disorders, in particular a focus on motricity from David Cohen that I see over there. Uh, hi, David. Hi. And, uh, so, can I share the screen? Yeah, sure. You can take over the control of the thing here. Hi, Antonio. <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah, I think we'll be able to see it. Okay, so you have uh, uh, you have forty minutes, I think. Yeah, forty thirty. You have to tell. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I try thirties because we are a little bit delayed. Hi, everybody. Okay. I think you you can hear me. I hope as uh, at least. Uh, and thanks for joining uh, so numerous this uh, workshop. So um, I, I'll try to talk about uh, robotics and neurodevelopment with a focus on motricity because uh, um, I'm going to share with you uh, two, uh, um, uh, two um, experiments that uh, we did not publish yet. So I wanted to have uh, also feedback from the community. So I'm, and I work a lot with uh, Salvatore and also with uh, Mohamed Chetwani from his year. Okay. Sorry, because uh, I share the screen, but I can't. Oh, OK. So this is the plan of my talk, a brief introduction. And we will uh, uh, also make a fast overview of robotics and autism, because I'm sure that most of you are a little bit aware of the topic. And we will uh, detail three um, experiments. Uh, the first one is about uh, exploring with a robot a, social, a motor well, social signature in autism. And the second one will be to explore uh, the micro movement hypothesis in autism. Um, and I'm going to explain why. And, um, and the third uh, um, uh, data I want to share is uh, 
some uh, something about remediation and treatment. And uh, in that case, it will be a treatment of uh, dysgraphia, which is uh, also in the list of neurodevelopmental disorder. So as an intro, I wanted to just uh, remind for those uh, who are not aware of what are the neurodevelopmental disorder in the DSM-5. And of course, the most famous one is maybe autism spectrum disorder, which is a, a disorder that associates impairment in social interaction and communication, and also stereotypies and restricted interest. And that includes also unusual sensory responses. But uh, neurodevelopmental disorder are not only uh, autism. They are, there is also intellectual disability, communication disorder, uh, developmental coordination disorder, learning disability, whether it is on reading, spelling, writing, or mathematics. There is also the very famous ADHD and also Tourette syndrome. The basic idea of neurodevelopmental disorder uh, is that they are caused by an early dysfunction of the brain or that their early occurrence impact neurodevelopment. And it's important to have both sides of uh, what is neurodevelopment in mind. Um, the second slide I wanted to share as an intro is the fact that uh, neurodevelopmental disorder and uh, robotic, it's a very hot topic. You have a lot of mediatic exposure, public expectation, People say that there is a potential economic market on that. Uh, I'm not an economist, so I don't know. Uh, and it is for sure a new paradigm of care. And that's what I am going to um, detail here for some aspect of motricity. But uh, in the same times, there are also ethics and clinical expectation. And I, I'm not going to read about this uh, uh, this survey that was done uh, a, a couple of years ago, but um, just to give you uh, an idea of uh, the question that therapists and clinicians have regarding the use of robots in uh, uh, NDD. So a fast overview, um, the, the three first slide are many pictures of, uh, of a robotic platform that have been used with uh, uh, autism, actually. So uh, I, I just go uh, quite fast uh, for these, two, uh, these three uh, slides. And in fact, there might be other now because the, the review I'm referring is a little bit old now. OK. And I think that uh, what is um, important to consider is um, first the aspect of the robot, uh, whether it is a humanoid, a non-humanoid, an animal-like robot, because uh, obviously the, 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 the partner of the robot uh, will uh, react differently uh, about that. But it's also important to have in mind the functionality of the robotic platform in terms of sensory, and se sensory reward and sensors, uh, displacement, uh, decision making and control, spontaneous engagement, and also whether or not it is possible to easily implement a new algorithm to uh, design specific tasks. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, ethics, there are also questions about safety, autonomy, adaptability that are important. And when you look at the literature of robotic and NDD, uh, most of the resource question regards uh, exploring the response of uh, uh, given children to different uh, uh, robots activity, uh, exploring the context in which the robot is used to stimulate a uh, behavior or to model a teacher task, and also to offer feedback uh, to the children. And just to give you uh, two specific examples uh, regarding NEO and Caspar, because they were the two robotic platforms that have been used uh, the most often in the literature, uh, at least in 2018, when we did this uh, review with uh, Charlene, a PhD of mine. And I, I will not go in detail uh, about uh, the description of the robots, but you have the specificities of, the, of now and Caspar on that slide. And also the targeted skills that we find in the literature um, uh, that the, the people who work with these, uh, uh, or the researcher that work with these uh, platform uh, wanted to uh, explore. 
So let's move now to our first resource question. It's about using robots to explore a social signature in autism. Here, the basic idea is to have a, a robot-centered approach. Usually, uh, in many studies, uh, you have a human-centered approach, and you compare uh, how human uh, individuals interact with a robot compared to an, uh, a human experimentator. Uh, the robot center approach is quite different because uh, here you use the robot as a partner to compare uh, two individuals or group of subjects. So we wanted to test um, the Melzoff like me hypothesis, which is an hypothesis uh, that uh, basically supposes that uh, since imitation is there at birth, as you see uh, on the on the left uh, photographs uh, of the slide, um, it means that at birth the baby is already uh, able to uh, recognize the same outside himself. So it's Melzov uh, hypothesized that it is like a, uh, um, an early self or a proto self, and uh, so we wanted to. Uh, taking uh, this, uh, this uh, developmental hypothesis and to test this into a robotic, uh, uh, several robotic experiments. And the, what the question we are asking is, can a ro robots learn to recognize individuals from imitative encounters with people uh, or avatars? So, um, the, the, the architecture we use in these experiments is summarized on that slide. And uh, um, you have uh, two uh, different uh, architecture of neural network. The first one is a, is a sensory motor coupling that is able to learn by imitation. So it's the purple uh, architecture actually. And uh, we also add a novelty detector, uh, which is based on the probabilistic learning, um, which is the red uh, neural network architecture. So the first experiment we have is uh, a learning by imitation. So in uh, that video, you are looking at a child with autism imitating now. So now randomly do the movement and the children is imitating now. And so what we did after the imitation game is to reverse the role. And because in less than two minutes uh, now with that kind of architecture is able to learn by imitation, then to imitate the child if the child begins the movement. And what we found, uh, this is the first result, is that when he is uh, uh, learning with children with autism, it's the green line on that slide, uh, he needs more computational neural to, neurons to learn uh, in the visual feature that I, uh, I've just shown previously uh, in that sl uh, slide of the architecture, uh, to learn by imitation with children with autism. This is not the case with a typical uh, with adults in red and uh, typical developing children in blue. And uh, what also we had here, when you look more uh, precisely on the, um, on the results, is you have uh, uh, some increase in the number of neurons needed to learn. And when we went back to the data, we discovered it was when it was a change of partner. So we, we had this idea, maybe he, he can recognize, to come back to uh, uh, meds of ID, uh, the new uh, interactor. So we uh, decided to um, also look here at the human recognition neural network and to use a uh, recognition test that was based on photograph after the experiment that was shown to the system. And if the computational neuron uh, was the right one uh, that was activated by the photograph, it means that it was uh, a recognition, a positive recognition. Otherwise, it was a misrecognition. So when we did that experiment, we used 
the data set that we had with the kids, as I shown on the video. We also changed the robot tick platform to see if our result was stable if we use uh, facial movement instead of uh, harm movement. And as the result were also found here, we decided to also control uh, with movement from avatars that were all white, because in the first experiment, we did not expect to go that far and we did not ask the, the, the participants to wear the same clothes or whatever. And the results are here. Uh, so this is the recognition score. And as you can see, whether it is uh, with now and the, the harm movement or with the uh, robot head with the facial movement or now with the avatar, in all cases, we have uh, a very significant uh, recognition score. So uh, it means that robots were able to learn to recognize their partner, whether human or avatar, after a single interaction through imitation. And that was a very interesting result. So we decided to go further on another set of analysis by, by adding on our architecture that you are, uh, that is modelized here, uh, a neural network of posture recognition, because we had the idea since it's a motor experiment that there was something in the motricity that was uh, significant to uh, to have this uh, um, motor social signature. So what we did in these experiments is we modified the number of neurons to uh, needed to learn uh, because we we had in the first experiment I showed you we left the system uh, have as many as neurons as needed uh, and uh, so we decided to limit the number of neurons to uh, have a constraint on the learning. And we also modified the, uh, the threshold in another experiment of the novelty detector. And basically what we learned from this experiment is that it was really the posture that was different in children with autism. So there is something in the motricity that has a specific signal. And that's move us to the uh, next question, which is, can we explore the micro movement hypothesis using robotic uh, interaction? Unfortunately, all I showed you previously, uh, we could not use that data to explore the micro movement analysis because we did not record appropriately um, uh, the children when they were uh, doing the experiment. We only register what was uh, in the uh, neural network architecture, actually. But as we do a lot of experiments in my department with uh, my uh, engineer partner, we, all, we had uh, other data on a joint attention induction with now, which is presented on the left of the slide, and another experiment, which is also a motor imitation, but it's a more uh, active imitation because we used uh, a tightrope walker avatar, actually. And in that experiment, what was very interesting for us is, is that we also included a group of children with developmental coordination disorder uh, together with a group of uh, children with uh, autism. And this is important because uh, developmental coordination, uh, they also have motor coordination problem like in autism, uh, but you, you, you're gonna see that the results are quite different. So in this experiment that we published in terms of uh, uh, robotics and psychological experiments, as we register uh, the video of the kids, we were able to uh, look uh, at also the uh, motor intensity uh, according to frequency. And here on that slide, you have the movement intensity during the joint attention induction with now according to frequency. And as it is video recording, we only have uh, the, the maximum uh, frequency that we are uh, precise enough is five Hertz. So it's obvious that uh, in uh, children with autism, you have more intensity of movement, whatever, whatever uh, the frequency is compared to typical developing. And when we look at the uh, experience with the, the, the avatar, in that case, it was even more interesting because we could separate uh, uh, the resting state because we register also uh, the kids 
during a posture register uh, resting state uh, at two time of the experiments that we group together and uh, as you can see the uh, again the movement analysis uh, uh, according the movement intensity sorry uh, according to frequency uh, is always higher in ASD compared to DCD and TD as we had a larger effect, uh, a larger sample, we, we use multivariate model. And uh, even uh, when you control for the other uh, parameter, which has age, uh, there is still a significant effect uh, for children with autism compared to typical developing and to uh, coordination disorder. And during the imitation, again, we also have a significant effect. Uh, and that was robust uh, even when we control for uh, the age, uh, but also the increased number of trial because this was a longer experiment with seven trial. And again, uh, we had uh, more intensity at all frequencies in ASD compared to typical developing and also compared to uh, developmental coordination disorder. So, we are aware that these are unpublished data and exploratory analysis right now, and they are raising many unsolved questions. The first one is, is this behavioral signature motoric in essence? And to, to have that, you need to have in mind that uh, we need to distinguish low and high frequency, in particular around 10 Hertz that we don't have in our, in our analysis. Because at 10 Hertz, uh, for a voluntary movement, we know that uh, they, uh, you can have sub-movement. And this sub-movement might be similar to micro-movement. We don't know because we don't have that high frequency. The second question is, is it possible to ascertain that these peculiarities occur during all motor tasks? Because we have voluntary movement, because it's imitation and posture, but uh, is, are these movements also uh, present uh, during procedural motor learning, such as writing or, or, uh, or other kind of motor tasks? So we need to explore that. And uh, of course, we want to know whether or not uh, this motor signature is specific to autism or is fine in all neurodevelopmental disorder that has, that has a motor dysfunction. So our idea is that it might be specific to autism since we have one experiment at least in which we have a group with uh, developmental coordination disorder. And we, we, we have seen in that experiments that uh, uh, autism were very different to uh, developmental coordination disorder, but we need to have more robust data on that. And finally, uh, now we're gonna move to a third use of uh, robot uh, human interaction in the field of uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. It is the field of uh, treatment or remediation. It's, it's maybe the more uh, exciting field actually. And the example I'm going to share with you um, is uh, again, uh, an unpublished uh, data about dysgraphia. So this work started by a collaboration with the EPFL um, that developed the core writer scenario and uh, in uh, uh, which is uh, uh, a scenario where you, you ask a kid to learn uh, a robot to write and it's learning, it used the learning by teaching uh, aspect. So um, during that collaboration, we also have uh, basic research regarding uh, uh, automated uh, um, feature uh, that are useful to understand in this graphia uh, on uh, specifically on tablet. And we, we basically uh, thought that writing dynamics, pen pressure, pen tilt were very important parameters uh, to master uh, during uh, learning of writing. So uh, the general uh, architecture, I mean, cognitive architecture of the scenario is that one. So we decided to start because we had the child and you're gonna see a video uh, of that child, Raphael, uh, that, was, that had a very severe dysgraphia with handwriting refusal. So it was very difficult to give him uh, class or classical uh, remediation because he did not want to, to just take a pen in his hand. 
So it was very uh, painful. So we decided to combine the co-writer setup with a serious game that we created uh, based on uh, his uh, uh, remediation, actually. And the, the cognitive architecture of our scenario is to work uh, in parallel with three uh, major aspects, which is relativizing, uh, responsibility, and step-by-step -step training and gamification. The idea is to increase self-confidence and self-esteem of the child, and also to increase the training opportunity and to adapt them to uh, his writing difficulties. So just to give you a teaser of a longer video that you will find to the website of the workshop, but it's too long to, to show it just in a conference. So it's only here one minute. Raphaël est un enfant qui était en grande difficulté d'apprentissage, donc si on donnait, et finalement ça se concentrait en particulier sur des difficultés d'écriture, au point qu'il en était arrivé à refuser d'écrire purement de sa peau. On a un peu pris au vol, finalement, sa difficulté particulièrement importante pour dire « mais pourquoi on n'essaierait pas, puisqu'on vient de récupérer que writer et que le système fonctionne, pourquoi on n'essaierait pas de voir si ça ne crée pas un changement dans sa thérapie ?» Et le résultat a été au-delà de tout ce qu'on pouvait espérer. Il nous a aidé finalement à conceptualiser un jeu sérieux, c'est-à-dire des exercices sur tablette, pour les psychomotriciens ou les graphothérapeutes qui prendront en charge les dysgraphiques. Okay, just a teaser. So go on the uh, the video. The four minute video is more uh, explicit. Anyway, just to uh, give you an idea of the serious game that we use together with the robotic interaction. So in addition to co-writer, which is an activity that he does, it's a turn writing taking uh, with the robot. We also have a tracking uh, exercise, a pressure exercise, uh, a tilt exercise. Uh, the rainbow is uh, an exercise where the kids is supposed to segmentate the, the writing. And we also have a grasping, which is not really a serious game, but uh, it's just to give you the whole aspect of the therapy that he went through for uh, 30 weeks. And just to give you the, the improvement of, uh, of uh, Raphael during this, uh, this treatment. So uh, basically you have uh, the BHK test, which is the gold standard, at least in, uh, in French language for uh, dysgraphia. And you have the two scores, the quality and the speed. And it's quite uh, um, normal that you see this variation between quality and speed, because when uh, speed increase, usually, quality decrease, and then uh, you have a, um, a combined uh, result of both. But anyway, as you can see, uh, after 10 weeks, uh, it was uh, uh, close and sometimes uh, above uh, the uh, threshold of pathology. So it really increased rapidly. Uh, I also show, can show you some uh, uh, features that he improved during uh, his treatment. So these are automatic features that were registered during uh, the serious game. So uh, uh, during co-writer, during the pressure, uh, during the tracking, during the tilt. So he improved mastering pressure, control of the tilt of the pen, and also speed uh, of, of uh, tracking. And, and very important also is the, the fact that when he was uh, uh, learning better to write, he also, he also uh, has a, a more uh, stable posture because usually when, when children have dysgraphia, they tend to have uh, a very uh, narrow distance between their head and the pen because they try to concentrate and to, to make it right. And uh, it's uh, because they are not easy with their body uh, during writing. So uh, let's conclude. I think I'm on time. So robotics offer clinicians new way to interact and work with people with neurodevelopmental disorder. They are promising in terms of research. 
However, robotics is a technological domain that has not reached the clinical achievement of serious game. I also have many programs in my department uh, using serious game. So uh, it's a literature I know well, and it's clear that in serious game, you have more uh, evidence-based data uh, on uh, some specific activities that are uh, already in the clinical domain. So the lack of robust studies with a strong methodology do not allow evaluating evidence-based benefits of uh, robotics in individuals with NDD. And for me, it remains mainly a promising uh, research field. And to finish, I, I want to thank uh, all the financing of this project and also all the partners I collaborate with and, and specifically um, EPFL, Sorbonne University and University Paris uh, because uh, these are the, the main uh, institution that collaborate, at least on the project I uh, presented today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. It was uh, really, really, really interesting. I don't know if there is in the public, uh, if there are in the public some questions or from the other channels. I think that maybe the website of IEEE followed down. So for the people that maybe have some problems to follow us here, uh, can just rely on, uh, on YouTube. Okay, no question on YouTube. Here, the crowd has some, some question. Yeah, yeah, my place. Hi. Thank you uh, for this very interesting talk. Um, I was interested in um, the findings you had about the motor signatures. Um, so um, eventually you said that uh, uh, the, the, the results until now are done for voluntary um, movements. And uh, what would you expect for a procedural um, more hierarchical, complex movements. Um, it's also a very interesting question for roboticists like me, because um, for us, we don't know exactly how to handle uh, movements, what we call like primitive movements, what we would call like um, procedural movements. Well, actually, it's a complex question you, you're asking, and I'm not sure I'm, I, I will be able to answer perfectly because I'm not a specialist movement. But uh, the, the point is that when we find that uh, a social signature that we believe is motoric in essence, because all the experiments were uh, based on motor interaction, um, we found in the literature, actually, this micro movement hypothesis in autism uh, that it's it's mainly um, uh, I'm looking for her name. Uh, it's uh, sorry, I don't have the name. Uh, Salvo, you you remember the name? No. Anyway, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, she she is uh, uh, she she did an experiment on pointing actually, which was not uh, on robotics. Uh, it was only with motor motor capture, and she did an experiment as well reanalyzing uh, resting data uh, during MRI. So it's very uh, unusual motor data. And she took, it's, well, it's Torres, the name of the, of the colleague. And uh, she, she decided to call it micro movements hypothesis. And we believe it was coherent with the result that we had. So uh, before uh, going forward the experiments to be more precise, I presented the data to Tamar Flash. I don't know if you know Tamar Flash. She's a, 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 she works in uh, robotics and mechanics, and she's a, a very keen in physics of movement. And that's her that uh, uh, was very challenging with the, the, the preliminary data that we showed us. Uh, we showed her, sorry, because she told me that, you know, in movement analysis, we know that around 10 Hertz, you have sub movement. So if you don't have specific analysis of what happens around 10 Hertz, you won't be able to say if it is just normal sub-movement that may have particularities in autism, or if it's really different kind of uh, micro-movement. 
And so she really wants to see what are the data around 10 Hertz. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's something that is quite difficult to handle because you have uh, in, the, in the field of uh, physics of movement, you also have jerk, jerk smoothness that are concepts very difficult to, uh, to grasp, but, are, but everybody understand that the harmony of movement, when you dance, when you, uh, when you synchronize you know, yourself with someone, you have something there and that's where we want to explore. But we need to have uh, higher frequencies to be sure to what we found. So to come back to your question, we want to do the same kind of experiments, adding other tasks, but using motion, ca motor, uh, motion capture to be sure to have all the palette of, uh, of, C of uh, frequencies that we need and not just what we can uh, learn from videos because they, we, we are more limited in terms of uh, frequency analysis. Thank you. Thank you. There are other questions here, uh, like uh, Elan, Elan Miravani. Uh, Elan, do you want to take the microphone maybe and uh, ask the question by yourself? Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question, uh, actually two questions. You uh, mentioned that uh, you monitored the, ch the child in the uh, co-write thing. I want to know if that uh, in, the, in that uh, serious game, the child is monitoring with the software only or just, uh, or in, and the robot task is monitor the posture of the child and collaborate with him. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, a multi-sensor activity because the, the robot does not do everything. Uh, so you have a combination of robotic activity, serious game activity. You also have a camera to monitor the, the, the posture, actually. It's not directly the robot because the robot, it's, the robot is on the side. And you also have the therapist that is present. I think that you will understand very well the scenario in the four minutes video. Uh, that we have uh, implemented on the website of the of the workshop, actually. Mm -hmm. And it it can also enhance the uh, difficulty of the game uh, during the therapy. Is it uh, is Sorry? it actually autonomously enhance the difficulty of the uh, game that the, the child wants to do? I mean, the difficulty of the, for example, writing tasks or. Yeah, well, I, I did not detail the, the serious game because the topic was on robotics, actually. Uh -huh. But uh, of course, the serious game has a progression in it, and uh, uh, and we adapt the difficulty of the serious game to the uh, the success of the child. So there are uh, you know adaptation in it uh, that are monitored uh, to the children, and actually we are because we, we work first on, uh, on, uh, on a tablet, which was uh, the, la um, the Wapcom, and now we are doing the series game with EPFL in a, very, uh, in a much easier tablet, like uh, iPad, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to have it uh, uh, more easily uh, diffused uh, in schools. That's, that's what our, our aim there. And may I ask another question related Please? to the neural network that you mentioned? And uh, uh, yeah, uh, did you also uh, consider the, uh, for example, autism level like like a girls' school that the children have in that neural network as an input or? Well, actually, uh, I did not detail the experiments here, but we we did not uh, we did not uh, use correlation, you know, with the uh, any kind of score of autism, but you need to understand that the children that went through these experiments were able to do the experiments. Otherwise, the, the robots could not learn uh, by imitation. So the, the children was able to learn the kid, uh, the, the robot, sorry. Uh, so he was able to do the imitation task. Otherwise, the, the robot can't learn. So it was obviously a certain level of autistic kids that we are included in that analysis. Yeah, thank you. Okay, maybe just a last question because we are already late. Uh, there's a, 
Kutluk Bilc. Uh, maybe you want to take the microphone. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Salvatore. Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Dr. Cohen. I would like to just ask uh, if you have any uh, experience or comments uh, about the detection of the ACD signature from the navigational uh, behavior of these children, such as their their uh, navigational uh, learning practice in a in a software uh, simulator uh, in a maze. Uh, so you can you can uh, record the trajectories, velocities. Uh, did you have any experience, or do you have any uh, comments uh, about such a such an implementation? Well, uh, I don't have specific uh, experience of uh, on the topic you are asking because uh, uh, the the only thing I can say is that uh, the the Tykotop Walker experiment actually was an experiment on, on uh, a special turn thinking, you know? Uh, uh, and we, we had, uh, that's why we had two sets of experiments. And what we found is that uh, um, at least for the adolescent with autism, they were quite able to have this perspective taking, at least spatially. Um, but that's, that's all I can say. And regarding uh, velocities, actually, we have the results on velocities, and they are quite la similar to that uh, I showed you uh, on, the, on the frequencies, uh, the movement in intensity according to frequencies. So there is a specific effect in autism that we don't find in BCD and in typical developing. But we want to go um, also on smoothness, because again, what uh, Tamar Flash told us about movement, it's really in smoothness and jerk that you find the most interesting uh, parameter that are related to the, the type of submovement that you have. So that's where we want to go. But regarding navigation, I would love to have uh, some uh, experiment with the navigation, but I don't have, sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, maybe we can go to the to the second uh, session. Uh, we have. Uh, um, yeah, we have the next session. It's the short presentations. Uh, maybe how long you want to say, cover? Okay. Um, so now we'll move on the next session of our workshop in which we will have four short presentations from our workshop uh, participants. So each presenter will have five minutes to present their work to the audience. And I would like to mention that um, we can also find uh, the longer version, um, the longer videos of those uh, presentations on uh, IEEE TV channel and also from our workshop uh, YouTube channel. Um, so you can also, uh, the, 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 the workshop participant can also ask questions, uh, very short questions to these uh, presentations as well. Um, so the first one uh, will be uh, Anna Freire. Um, Hi. And, uh, yeah. So can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah. sure. Sorry. So, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anna Fried, and I'm here on the behalf of my team. So, we developed a study that used now robot as a tool operator in therapy sessions with mental impaired individuals. So, first, uh, before I begin, I would like to congratulate, uh, congratulate the organization for all the efforts made uh, to make this workshop possible. So, first, I will start by a contextualization of the subject, uh, followed by a presentation of the objectives and methods used throughout the, the study. Then I will analyze the results and make some conclusions. So uh, nowadays, sev are, several are the um, studies that use humanoids and more specifically now uh, in order to help the elder population or children or young adults with mental impairments in order to either prevent their cognitive decline, improve their psychosocial outcomes or the patient capabilities and lifetime. 
Moreover, uh, people with uh, mental impairments are often characterized by not being able of living by themselves due to delays in their development of cognitive, uh, motor and social skills. Therefore, those people normally live uh, with care providers or in specialized um, home cares. Uh, however, even when inserted in those facilities, they often show resistant behaviors and tantrums uh, whenever they don't want to do a specific task. Therefore, uh, the aim of this work was to understand how the human robot interaction would actually um, work with these uh, people with cognitive impairments and how would it uh, impact their lives. So uh, we wanted to test application of the humanoid now uh, in therapy sessions in order to verify if uh, this human robot interaction would improve their cognitive skills and their development of eye gaze and joint attention. Moreover, the robot adopted was now, as I mentioned, uh, due to its simplified as human-like features that are extremely captivating to work with in this type of study. So uh, the intervention uh, involved 12 participants that were submitted uh, in groups of three to two different approaches, a robot-based approach and a game-based approach. Both approaches were video recorded. So on one hand, uh, the in the robot-based approach, we use uh, NOW and its multi-desk application choreograph, uh, as well as a Wizard of Oz approach. On the other hand, in the game-based approach, we use a PowerPoint presentation with a two-level game. So uh, this, uh, this uh, study involves several phases. First, uh, the operator would do a general introduction, uh, introducing uh, herself and the, um, the approaches to the participants. Afterwards, the operator would int introduce now as a robot, and soon after, the robot-based approach would start. As soon as the robot-based approach would finish, the operator would uh, do the transition to the game-based approach, uh, where uh, she would explain how uh, was the game, the rules of the game, and uh, would help the participants with the questions and manipulating the computer. So. Through the graphs, uh, it's possible to tell that in total, seven out of 12 of the participants looked away more often during the game-based approach, which means that they uh, were more focused during the robot-based approach. Moreover, in total, just one participant, participant A3, was uh, uh, presented the contrary relation, and the theory for others didn't show any difference between approaches. However, if we compare categories, and more specifically, if we compare the self-destructed category uh, that are the bars in orange in the game-based approach with uh, a new category where we subtract the, the, uh, the number of no interactions to the total, uh, we can say that 10 out of 12 participants were more focused during the game-based approach due to the, the reasons mentioned earlier. So just one participant, participant C1, showed the contrary relation, and just one other participant, uh, B1, didn't show any difference between approaches. Hence, the participants uh, treated now as a social being, either trying to talk to it or physically interact to, uh, with it throughout the session. So the results obtained uh, from both approaches were according to what was expected and uh, actually positive once that it was proven that the young adults with mental impairments can improve their focus during a task conducted by now. Um, moreover, we could create a stimulating learning environment once that it was possible to assess the efficiency of now as a teaching tool uh, that was able to improve the participants' eye gaze and joint attention during the approach. Moreover, uh, we uh, could observe that the interaction of the participants did in fact change in the presence of the robot. Though future work must be conducted in order to better support these claims. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. And the next presenter will be uh, Nabanita Paul from the Indian Institute of Science, India. Hello, uh, I'll share my screen. Yes, please. Okay. 
my screen visible? Yes, yes. Hello. Please go ahead. Uh, we can uh, uh, sure. see you. Hello, everyone. I'll be talking about our paper, Teaching Assistance Through Social Robotics for ASD, Toy Robot as Speech Buddy, and Mini Drone as Exercise Partner. Let me begin by introducing the authors. Myself, Nabanita Paul, Siddharth Ramesh, and Professor Chiranjeev Bhattacharya are from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And Jayashree Ramesh, Priya Vijayan, Anupama S are from Academy for Severe Handicaps and Autism, also situated in Bangalore, India. So I'll talk about the motivation for our paper. Socially assistive robotics are robots that primarily help users in particular tasks only through social interaction. They have been used as therapeutic coaches for rehabilitation patients, for elderly care, Alzheimer's patients, autism interventions, and many other scenarios with very encouraging results. In this work, we set out to design, deploy, and evaluate some socially assistive robots in academics of ASD children, specifically in verbal communication and motor development lessons. We focus on two broad challenges. First is verbal communications with problems such as echolalia, difficulty in responding spontaneously, answering in single words, and difficulty in taking turns in a conversation. Second is motor challenges, which includes gross and fine motor skills, lack of good posture, and difficulty in age-appropriate self-care tasks, such as tying shoes or even running. So the blue-colored ones are directly tackled in our intervention. Many studies show that autistic children have positive learning outcomes with robots. But a recent 2016 survey on various robot-mediated autism interventions note that very few studies have used robots directly in the education curriculum of an autistic child and highlights this as an important area for future research. Furthermore, although both non-humanoid and humanoid robots have been used, the few studies that deal with our target areas, that is a triadic classroom intervention for verbal communication and motor development, use humanoid robots. So I've included some pictures of Caspar and now for reference. And these humanoid robots can be a little expensive. So we asked the question, can we use readily available, low cost non-humanoid robots for triadic classroom interventions for ASD children? So we call such interventions teaching assistance through SARS. Just to give a perspective on the design challenges, on the right, we see two low-cost commercially available robots that we used in our study, a toy robot Cosmo by Anki and a mini drone. Even if Cosmo has a resemblance to toy robot, the drone as a socially assistive robot for autism is unheard of. So we were unsure if this would even work. Specifically, the questions were, can a non-humanoid robot elicit verbal responses from an ASD child in the same manner as the child answers to humans? And can a drone elicit motor responses from an ASD child in the same manner as an exercise coach? As it is not a well-studied area, a lot of field testing was done. And as seen in the pictures, free-form interactions were allowed to see the children respond. Since this was an extremely non-linear process, we document our findings as SAR intervention design guidelines. Following these guidelines, we designed toy, uh, two interventions using toy robot for verbal communication lessons and mini drone for exercise lessons. We got very encouraging results even in this short study. In the Cosmo session, one participant who was extremely reluctant to write started writing to recall spellings on receiving a negative feedback from Cosmo without any persuasion. Writing was not even a part of the task instructions. A writing pad was simply kept in front of him. So this was very surprising. In the drone session, a participant who was extremely hypoactive and required two special educators to help her perform simple exercises she started exercising with a smile. 
started following the drone without any physical assistance from her teacher. Even her neck posture improved while she gazed at the drone. And this came as a great relief to her teacher. Thus, we found that non-humanoid robots can be helpful as teaching assistants in ASD children's education. Although we focus on autism, we believe that SAR interventions with non-humanoid robots could potentially be applied in other NDD domains as well. For more details, uh, such as robot details and interventions and testimonials, we have created a short video that is there in the website. And for this de design in de details interventions, qualitative evaluations, we would urge the audience to look at our paper and our website. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next presentation from Lee Min Hoon from Carnegie Mellon University. Okay. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is been uh, today I will have a presentation about designing personalized interaction of a socially assisted robot for stroke rehabilitation, which is like done jointly with Dan, Asim, Alex, and Sergi. So physical therapy sessions are critical to regain the functional ability of the patient with the neurological and musculoskeletal problems, such as a stroke. However, uh, stroke patient can receive a limited number of uh, therapeutic sessions due to the high cost and the limited availability of the therapist. So researchers has like, envisioned a uh, socially assisted robot for rehabilitation, which can replicate the role of a therapist by demonstrating an exercise or providing some direction for improvement. And in addition, researchers also demonstrate that effects of the physical embodiments. And also they show that the elderly people can engage a rehab a exercise session, multiple exercise session. However, the, these prior uh, mainly rely on the, the predefined uh, corrective feedback. Basically they check the a range of uh, joint angle and try to see whether the range of motion is like fully achieved or not, so that they could provide uh, the limited feedback uh, in terms of the uh, arm position. So this work present an interactive approach that could uh, automatically identify a salient feature of the assessment to predict the quality of motion in uh, three performance components like range of motion, smoothness and compensation. And then, uh, so we trained uh, the policy that could uh, select this uh, feature and then predict uh, the quality of motion. And then when a new patient comes in, uh, our policy can uh, dynamically select the feature and then uh, generate the uh, feedback based on the the feature that are mo most divergent. So this is like the simple setup uh, with uh, the robots and the tablet uh, interface uh, and the Kinect sensor. Now I will describe more detail about the implementation parts. Uh, so here the first, uh, we utilize a Kinect sensor to track the joints uh, of the patients performing an exercise. And then we extract uh, various features such as joint angle, or the trajectory uh, between like two joints or other speed related variables. And given these uh, multiple sets of variable, uh, we try to uh, apply the Mar Markov decision process to learn an uh, agent that could uh, select the sale and feature for assessment. So this is like formulate to minimize like the, given these various uh, sets of variable, it's aimed to minimize like number of variable while maximizing classification. So the state space is like the, the entire power set of the feature. And then the action space is to query the unselected feature. And then the agent received the, the negative reward when it's uh, uh, keep adding the new feature. 
so that we end up learning this policy. And for the implementation, we uh, apply the Q learning with the neural network and then evaluate uh, with the leave one subject out cross validation. And this one is a uh, simple, uh, the, the current interface uh, of our system, which can uh, track the drawing position and uh, pre present the predicted assessment. And then based on the diversion, the join uh, the feature value of the feature, uh, you could generate uh, corrective feedback. Uh, for the empirical evaluation, uh, we collected the data set uh, from 15 post-stroke and 11 healthy subjects, which were annotated by the two therapists. And uh, we found that our approach uh, can uh, achieve the significantly better performance than classical the feature selection algorithm. At the same time, uh, it achieves a comparable performance to the therapist agreement level. So to conclude, uh, we present an interactive approach that could uh, dynamically select the feature to predict the uh, assessment and generate uh, personalized corrective feedback. And uh, we demonstrate the potential of uh, replicating therapist assessment with a good uh, decent performance. Uh, in future, we will like to evaluate the usefulness of this system uh, with the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, our next speaker is Linda Ballet from Esati Cote d'Ivoire. Hi, everybody. Um, I would need you to allow me to share the screen, please. If the previous participant can stop the share. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks again to all of the organizers and the uh, short presentations before. Very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I am from uh, Isatik Cote d'Ivoire, but I'm um, doing a thesis with um, Ecole Doctorale Polytechnique here in Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Institut Mines Telecom Atlantique uh, in France. So the um, subject is how an automated gesture imitation game can improve social interactions with teenagers with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, for my first year of thesis, um, I'm working with a Salmao, Dr. Salmao Nguyen, Dr. Christophe Lohr, and um, the thesis directors are um, Professor Ioannis Canelos and Professor uh, Olivier Asse. Uh, the purpose of the research is basically this one, the design of a social technical system that will implement a gesture imitation game uh, in order to help improve social interactions with adolescents with autism spectrum disorder in Cote d'Ivoire. Follow some justification uh, as to why a socio-technical system and not just a technical one, why an imitation game. I think Dr. Cohen talked about it earlier, the importance of imitation and using imitation games, and why adolescents with ASD. Um, most related studies focus on, teen, on children today, and there is a need for studies involving teenagers. The simple hypothesis tested by the pilot study um, are the following. So uh, induced imitation in particular, not spontaneous, but really induced imitation is possible with um, a set of teenagers with ASD. Um, an artificial intelligence algorithm using open pose in particular, can be used in a real life environment to detect the poses of those participants. And the design scenario allows for the establishment of basic social relationships. The main methods used uh, during that unique session uh, last February uh, in Adichon um, were the use of um, the participation of four adolescents with ASD, they were aged 12 to 18 years old, uh, with cars uh, scores between 33 and 47. Um, the base configuration was that um, in the room we had the participant with ASD, 
that was accompanied into the room by a caregiver. We have another caregiver inside the room, the human experimenter, a technical operator uh, for the computer, um, and uh, two people recording the scene from different viewpoints. One for, from a global viewpoint, and the second one from the experimenter's point of view, which would later on be the social robot's point of view. During the imitation game, uh, we uh, had four phases, the greetings, pairing, gesture imitation, and closing. And um, as I said before, we use the open pools algorithm uh, running on a computer with an internal camera for the pose detection. For social interactions um, in the literature, we see a lot of different um, ways of um, assessing in our case, we observed head orientation, uh, smiles, laughter, holding hands, and we also even had uh, hugs from some participants. So here in the results, we want to uh, explain uh, why the pose detection did not fully work in certain cases. So for example, in this case with this participant here, uh, the left leg was occluded by the left hand. This is the reason why the skeleton is incomplete. Here we have inappropriate lighting uh, and the loose outfit that makes it difficult uh, to, um, to detect the pose, as well as a body occlusion with the left, left arm here. In this case, um, legs were joined and uh, this lighting still non-uniform made it difficult to detect the lower part of the, the body. And uh, on this last picture, uh, the participant's right arm once again was occluded because of the three quarter position and same lighting that is not appropriate for our case. So um, basically uh, the induced imitation is definitely possible with a selected set of adolescents with ASD. Um, because we could see that three out of the four participants actually imitated gestures upon request. An artificial intelligence algorithm here, open pose, can be used in a real life environment to detect the poses of adolescents with ASD. Uh, indeed, um, the failures that we, we detected could be explained. Um, we just need to be very careful with some specific environment settings um, such as uh, you know, lighting, uh, clothing, etc. The design scenario allows for the establishment of social relationships um, as measured on the parameters that we, we decided to, to work on. Um, we could say that uh, social relationships could be established with all four participants. There is a link uh, to the session video that is here. Um, there was a little mistake in the, in the article. So if someone is interested, please uh, use this link here uh, rather than the one in the, um, in the paper. In the video presentation, I mean. So uh, the future work that we plan on is to use a robot instead of the human experimenter with a camera and the full game algorithm. Uh, for the full game, game algorithm today, we are working on refining the types of movements uh, that we need to work on. Um, in particular, the level of complexity of the movements. Um, Mai um, asked the question to Dr. Cohen regarding this earlier. And um, also we were thinking of using you know, slower movements, thinking of you know, some particular um, types of movements like Tai Chi ones, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your presentation. And I would like to thank all four presenters for your short presentation. Uh, it's interesting to see that all these uh, four studies was, were conducted in like four different continents, although we didn't pick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so now I would like to give the stage back to Salvo. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I think uh, uh, all the four, four presentations were very interesting. I don't know if there are some comments in uh, the uh, in the audience. Uh, 
if there is someone that want to add uh, something or want to add some questions, or if we can go to the next. Uh... Anyway, you will find uh, all the videos as uh, Hong Long said uh, on both the, the the YouTube channel and uh, on the IEEE uh, page of the workshop. Uh, also, I don't remember if I saw I said that. Um, uh, the contributors uh, uh, brought also papers in which you have the, the detail of this project, so the project they presented. So uh, this this uh, uh, these uh, papers are uh, published on the website uh, of, on website of the workshop, so you can find everything there. Um, you can download everything basically. Uh, okay, so. So maybe we can move to the next next session. Uh, we have uh, another another invited guest, Brian Scassellati from Yale, uh, that will present our work on uh, um, enoma assistance for children and adults with ASD. So, Brian, I don't know if you are there. Yes, thank you. Okay, do you? Please take over the. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen then. Perfect. So, can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Oh, good. Please. All right. Uh, so, first, uh, uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here today. I can remember uh, starting out in this area 15, 20 years ago. Uh, when it was myself and Kirsten and Hideki Kozuma uh, sitting around a table uh, thinking about whether we could put robots with uh, children with ASD. Um, and now to see, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of people coming together from so many different places, uh, this is really, really fantastic and wonderful. Um, I, uh, I want to talk today specifically about uh, two projects. One that is uh, a very much finished piece of work and one that is very much work in progress, um, where we've been trying to transition work out of the clinic and out of the nice controlled laboratory settings and into the home. Um, and to talk a little bit about why we want to do that and uh, some of the challenges of doing that. Um, but just to uh, start out here, uh, make sure I have... There we go. Um, my group has been involved in uh, a number of different things in working with uh, specifically children with ASD, um, focusing on trying to build uh, clinically verifiable evidence about the effects of robots when we bring them into contact with children on the spectrum. Um, and along the way, we've shown uh, how robots particularly can uh, be very effective at increasing human-to-human -human interaction uh, when the robot is present, uh, looking at why robots are uh, particular in this ability and how robots can do this uh, when other technologies cannot, uh, being able to predict whether robots would be able to do uh, this kind of uh, social uh, catalysis uh, with gaze tracking models, and demonstrating that it's not a function of the robot being novel or being simpler than human interactions or having a more limited behavioral repertoire. Um, and I, I think it's critical for us to remember that not only are we trying to understand uh, how to use these robots effectively, but I think the, the real prize for us is being able to demonstrate why it is that the robots are effective. Um, what is it about robots that are uh, able to trigger these very interesting kinds of positive therapeutic effects uh, in individuals with ASD? Um, we've also looked at, uh, along the way, uh, ways of conducting screening uh, and uh, uh, diagnostic measures for autism using uh, quantifiable, uh, repeatable stimuli from robots and also looking at novel uh, training mechanisms, especially my favorite where we use the robot as a novice and have kids with ASD teach social skills to the robot. 
um, that turns out to be extremely effective. Um, but uh, to get back to the point of today, all this work that that I, my group has done, all this group that uh, work that many others have done, we've been very much focused on things that we can do inside the laboratory or inside the clinic, and that's a natural starting point for this kind of work. Um, in the clinic, in the lab, we have control over the environment to a great extent. We have a wide range of sensing options and computation options at our disposal. But our goal has to be eventually to be able to move outside of the clinic and move into the home because there's just too much of a labor shortage for us uh, to be able to have trained systems that work with each and every individual on the spectrum. And that means we're going to have to meet them where they are. Now, the home is a, a very complex place to try to put robots. And there's a reason why we don't do this. Um, and that's because it's much, much harder than being able to rely on some of the nice things that we have when we deal with uh, the clinic or the laboratory. Um, when we start losing control of the environment, when we start losing control of uh, having good lighting and good Wi-Fi and being able to control what kinds of sensors are placed where in the environment, then it actually becomes a much more complex uh, systems building challenge. Um, but not only that, as we look at moving into the home, we have to start considering much longer lengths of deployment, having much more stable hardware, and the evaluation criteria that we need to use become much more complex, not just because they become uh, longer periods of time that we're looking at, but because we're going to demand much more from these systems. So uh, while there are a lot of challenges involved in this, I think there is a lot to be gained by trying to make this move and trying to make this move now. Um, we have more reliable hardware at our disposal than ever before. We have more uh, rich uh, and complex sensory uh, systems that we can reuse off the shelf than ever before. And we need to start thinking about these things, not just as one exposure or, or a few exposure type systems, but as some sort of constant support. So I wanna give you uh, an example of that. Um, and this is from a piece of work that we published two years ago uh, in Science Robotics, where we took a collection of 20 robots and installed them into homes uh, with a family, with a child with autism spectrum disorder. And we left the robot in these homes for a month. Um, and our goal was to really drop this robot off on day one and not to have any contact with the robot or with the family until we picked it up on day 30. We wanted the system to work completely out of the box uh, for the family to be able to basically unbox it, install it, uh, and get it up and running. And then for the robot to be able to adapt and personalize itself to the particular needs of that family, of that child, uh, along the course of that uh, 30 days. Um, this was a, a large systems engineering effort uh, that involved my group, uh, Cynthia Brazil's group at MIT, Maya Moderick's group at USC, um, Malta uh, Young's group at Cornell, um, and uh, a fantastic array of other supporting characters who you can read about in the paper. Um, but uh, this work was for us the real uh, sort of first step out into the world to see whether we could build systems that could operate on their own successfully without constant human support uh, for these systems. Um, now, what did the systems do? Well, they were designed to interact with uh, the child and with a parent um, to be a kind of mediator between the two as they played a series of social games. And we used uh, an off-the-shelf robot, uh, a piece of hardware uh, that uh, Cynthia's group had developed called Jibo. Um, and we did that specifically because we wanted something that had uh, enough stability in it that we wouldn't have to worry about hardware breakdowns throughout the month. Um, but also because we were doing this at a reasonable scale, we needed to be able to have 20 of these systems to deploy at once. 
um, and uh, fabrication became a, a real challenge for us. So the robot would sit each day and for 30 minutes a day, play a series of social games with the child and with a parent or caregiver. Um, those games were designed uh, to run on a tablet um, and they were the same kinds of games that we would have played with the child if we had a therapist, a human therapist, who could visit the home every day for that month. They focused on common problems that we see with children in this age range uh, between five and 12 um, who were uh, verbal um, but uh, relatively moderate functioning on most social scales. Um, we looked at things like emotion understanding, telling stories and being able to understand the emotional impact of those stories, joint attention, being able to draw someone else's focus to the same target that you were looking at, uh, turn-taking skills, and also a series of barrier games uh, that focus on perspective taking. Um, we took these games uh, specifically from uh, our developmental colleagues um, who were using these exact same games in therapy sessions with kids on the spectrum um, when they went for home visits. Um, and we deployed these systems in homes. And uh, if you are a roboticist, uh, you know that the complexity of an environment uh, is very much impacts what you were able to do in that environment. And uh, having worked with systems in a wide range of, of different environments, I can very clearly say I would rather work with a robot that was on uh, the moon or Mars than in a child's bedroom. The level of complexity in that space is just uh, astounding. Um, we had many of these systems uh, where we never saw the same background twice. Uh, many of these systems where lighting was a real issue, one family who wanted to put the robot in a basement with a single uh, incandescent bulb swinging on a chain over top. Um, we had one family who wanted to put it right in front of uh, a large open set of windows where the cameras had trouble seeing anything other than the bright sunlight. But the robot was designed to uh, work with these children for 30 minutes each day and to engage them in a triadic interaction. And I'm gonna mute the video here for a moment. But as the child and the parent play together, the robot acts as a kind of moderator. And when things are going well and they're playing successfully and uh, performing the therapy tasks that they're supposed to be doing, the robot does very little. Um, but when uh, things tend to get off track or when they need a little bit more direction, the robot steps in. And we very specifically designed this so that uh, we were always having the child focus on building skills with the parent rather than building up skills that were directed at the robot. Um, as our clinicians uh, would like to say, there's no uh, inherent value in training kids to interact with robots. Um, what you want to do is train them to interact with people. Um, so the robot here was really a, a kind of catalyst to increase the amount of interaction between child and parent. Um, what made this uh, study particular and different? Um, uh, as, you can, as I said, it was completely autonomous. We had no contact with the robot whatsoever uh, for those 30 days. Um, the systems were adaptive, so there was a machine learning system on board that was constantly adapting uh, both the difficulty of the games that we were uh, playing, the types of games that we were playing, uh, selecting out of a set, um, and uh, changing the method of delivery um, to try to find things that were most effective in working with that child. For example, some kids worked extremely well uh, if the robot asked them to help them out with a favor, um, whereas other kids seem to respond much more uh, when we ask them to compete against someone else's high score. Um, we had to deal with all the complexities of being in the home environment and all of these different individual aspects. And this was something that we couldn't pre-program the robots to deal with. The robot had to adapt to those changes itself. And finally, and probably most importantly, we really wanted to be able to test generalized skill use. 
Um, we wanted to be able to measure the success of this system, not just against uh, ourselves and how well they were doing with the robot, but against a clinical standard that we could measure independently and without the robot or the parent being present. Um, so uh, we had a, a series of metrics that looked at uh, different uh, varying levels of uh, sort of uh, what we would think of as clinical veracity um, at sort of the lowest level, which was just how well were the kids doing in the games that we had established. Um, and sure enough, for uh, almost all of the kids, uh, we saw them increase their performance in these games over the uh, number of sessions that they played. Um, here, the number of sessions is the number of sessions for that game in particular. Not every child played every game on every day, uh, so we normalize for that. Um, second, we wanted to see that the parents were actually seeing some kind of impact. And while this was a subjective measure, and this was something that had a certain amount of reporting bias to it, um, we did see that the parents had, were very much uh, saying that the children were increasing the amount of eye contact they were making, increasing the number of uh, communications that they initiated, that the child initiated, and increasing in their responses to communication bids from the parent or from someone else. Um, and not only was this happening, it was happening when the robot was not present. That is not when they were engaged with the robot, but at other times during the day. Um, finally, and probably uh, you know, the most important measure that we took is that we, uh, we had the children interviewed by one of our clinicians um, at a series of points, uh, both 30 days before the robot uh, was introduced to the family, on the first day that the robot was introduced, the last day that the robot was with the family, and then 30 days after the robot had been taken away. Uh, we measured their performance on a set of social skills, the same set that we had uh, been training with the robot. And we did this uh, sort of staggered measurement uh, with the clinician in a different environment, without the robot present, without the parent present. So that is, this is sort of the hardest measure for kids to do well at. They had to take whatever they had learned when they were working with the robot and with their parent and generalize it to a new adult in a new situation. Now we measured the uh, 30 days beforehand just to see uh, whether children were making progress without the robot um, based on uh, all of them were involved in schools and other therapies um, and working with their families in normal cases. And we saw no significant difference over 30 days before the robot was uh, with the family. During the 30 days with the family, all of our kids showed a statistically significant increase in social skills. So that is being with the robot helped. Um, but that 30 days after the robot had been taken away, most of them had lost those skills. That is, those skills had faded uh, to some extent without practice. Now, this wasn't a surprise to us. And in fact, this is exactly the pattern that we were looking for. Um, we don't have any human-based therapies that will be completely effective after just 30 days. So we weren't expecting to see any robot-based therapies that were gonna be effective in just 30 days. Um, and in fact, with this ABA design, we were really looking for that system to go away as verifiable proof that it was the robot intervention that was causing this and not something else that had happened uh, during that 30-day robot intervention that was not related to the robot. Um, so we, were, uh, we feel very confident with this kind of data um, saying that it is the robot that is having this impact. Um, we knew that 30 days was not going to be long enough for us to show a permanent uh, increase in performance for the kids, um, but we're hoping that with longer exposures that we will be able to do that. Um, our best really and perhaps most important result though is what the families thought of these systems. And I want to play you just a little bit. We asked the families just to record themselves uh, you know, on their cell phones and, and send us video of what they thought about the system. Um, most of our families sent us uh, anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 minutes of them, uh, of their recordings uh, at the end of the day. This family sent us about half an hour of uh, just the mother in this case talking about the robot. 
um, but I'll only play about 30 seconds of this, so. He is so excited to spend this half an hour helping the robot um, find his way home. And you can hear and this audio, he yes? Will come on and I will set it up for him, turn on the robot, and he is engaged immediately. And having the ability to have this robot and to do a half an hour therapy with him that was really specific to what he needs to focus on was just, it seems like a great opportunity for him. And it, it's really been just, he's been engaged and intrigued. And um, sometimes the th therapies are, they get a little exhausting. He's not excited in this one wasn't like that he was he was ready to play at 7 30 in the morning <laughs> that um we went to the to the playground one day and i noticed immediately he, there was a group of children playing um in the sand and he walked up to them and said hi you know what are you doing and i don't think he would have done that a month ago she was a robot so i'll stop her before it's with this um uh, can you still hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things we noticed is that almost all the families talked about how interactions with the robots had changed their children's behavior outside of the home. Um, so away from the robot, away from interacting with the people that they had even been training with. Um, uh, this family in particular, um, I, I felt a great uh, synergy with um, if you notice, the, the bookshelves were all empty, and uh, they hadn't been empty when we had installed the robot. Um, it turned out that the uh, family had gotten a new job offer and were scheduled to move in the middle of the month. And so they decided that they wanted to ship all of their belongings out to their new home, uh, but they didn't want to risk losing the robot and leaving the study. Um, and so they decided to sleep on the floor, on mats on the floor, uh, so that they could spend the last two weeks with the robot. Um, now, we hadn't known this because we had no contact with the family at the time. I'd have been happy to send the robot with them, um, but that was the kind of response that we saw from these families uh, from uh, their interactions with these systems. Okay. So let me... Um, transition now just to talk about a, a second project and, and one that I'm really excited about. Um, for years, we've talked about uh, kids and to some lesser extent, adolescents uh, with ASD. Um, and there's been almost no uh, use of technology with adults with ASD. Um, and I, uh, a few years ago, we started working on this project um, specifically to look at how we could help adults with uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, deal with the unemployment gap that many of them see. So in the US alone, every year we have 70,000 uh, children with autism who become adults with autism and who face some very severe uh, barriers to gainful employment. And <clears throat> excuse me, by the numbers that we've seen, about 80% of those individuals will have some type of chronic unemployment or underemployment uh, throughout their lifetime. Now, many of this comes from uh, difficulties with the way that we see uh, interviews being scheduled and the kinds of tasks that can be done. Um, so in collaboration with a number of people uh, from Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt and Cornell, um, we've been trying to see whether or not we could build technology that would help individuals who are on the spectrum to find and match with the right kinds of careers and to successfully pass through uh, the kinds of social engagements that they were going to need in a typical workplace uh, engagement. Um, my uh, part of this project um, focused uh, mostly on dealing with interruptions. Um, so uh, we know that uh, for many individuals who are on the spectrum, one of the characteristics that we see is they have difficulty in uh, moving away from the routine. And uh, for many of them, that means that typical workplace environments um, are very, very challenging. Um, uh, this is a quote from Aaron Likens, who's the National Autism Ambassador in the United States for Easter Seals. And he said, that's the way my brain is. Uh, once it's speed, I can focus with perfect clarity, but that one interruption can bring about a complete change in ability to focus or achieve a task. 
Um, it's why the unsuspecting interrupter is likely to get what sounds like an angry answer from me. Um, and yet the kinds of tasks that we often see people work, moving into in their first employment um, are often tasks that require a wide range of interruptions. Um, so we ask people, for example, to go and stock shelves in a market or in a store, and you have customers who will come by and interrupt what they're doing and ask questions like, where can I find uh, the pickles? We ask them to do things like data entry or uh, labeling uh, training sets, and you have coworkers who will come and interrupt that work by asking questions like, can you cover my shift tonight? Or we give them maintenance or support tasks like installing solar panels, tasks that require a great deal of focus and attention, but still you'll have an employer call and say, can you do this job first? Or can you work on this area first? And all of these kinds of interruptions are the, the, the types of things that many adults with ASD find to be one of the real challenges in dealing with what are otherwise jobs that they are very well suited for and can accomplish um, uh, in other cases. So our thought was to try to build a system that would allow individuals uh, from their home to practice dealing with interruptions. That is to have a desktop robot-based system um, that sat on the table, on a counter, somewhere in their home, um, and that alternated between an inactive mode where it was basically asleep and not doing anything, and then would occasionally interrupt what you were doing, ask you a work-related question, and then monitor your performance and then go back to what it was sleeping. Um, this kind of uh, interruption is one that practice does make a difference for. And uh, we've been working on developing these systems to be able to go and put them into homes. Now, unfortunately, uh, our pilot testing for this was disrupted uh, by the global pandemic. We were no longer allowed to go out and do human subjects work. Um, so instead, I had my students test this out in the lab. And we'll show you some of the uh, intermediate results uh, from these systems. Um, so here's the system uh, in one prototype scenario uh, with uh, a job interruption with a student named Rohit. Hey, Rohit, can you swap schedules with me on Saturday? Sure, what time's your shift? It's from 2 to 6 p.m., thanks a bunch. No problem. Great, all right. So the system is designed to be able to interrupt while Rohit is engaged in some task that is not social interaction, while he's watching TV or playing a video game or doing something that is a reasonable time for us to interrupt him. Um, here's another example with the manual. Hey, Emmanuel, are you done with the Peterson account yet? Um, no, I will get it done by tomorrow morning. And once the interruption is over, Emmanuel's gone back to watching the tennis match. Um, this kind of system we're hoping um, is one that we can use to practice in real world uh, interruptions, but from the safety in some ways of your own home. Um, we need to use a real robot for this though, because we can't practice with something that's on a screen or on a tablet because we can't rely on the fact that that screen or that tablet is gonna be turned on and accessible at any point um, during the day. It, you can't practice interruptions when you're ready to be interrupted effectively. Um, finally, we think that we can do this in the home uh, in large part because it gives us an opportunity to practice both uh, when you have achieved a job, but also prior to achieving a job and dealing with this kind of performance uh, anxiety is one of the things that many adults will face. Um, now, there have been some real challenges along the way. 
Um, we want to interrupt when it's appropriate for the robot to interrupt. If you're having a deep and useful conversation with your roommate, uh, that is not a good time for us to interrupt. And that means the robot has to be able to sense the difference between, for example, a live actual conversation and a conversation that's happening on TV. And that's a real interesting challenge for us from a computational standpoint. How do we tell the difference between what is a live interaction and what's not? Um, the systems that you saw was, was uh, not using pre-scripted uh, performance. It was not, uh, using a very limited bit of natural language understanding so that there could be a slight back and forth as you saw. Um, uh, and that uh, being able to expand that to a wider range of tasks and a wider range of interruptions is a real challenge. Um, finally, uh, we don't right now deal with any bits of uh, verifying that the etiquette of a conversation has been followed. Um, we do need to put something into place to deal with that. Um, and mostly we need to be able to track performance over longer periods of time to say, how well are you doing with dealing with these interruptions? Can we summarize that in some way? Okay. So uh, to wrap up, I'll take two more minutes here just to say a couple of things, uh, some pointers to places that if you're looking for good surveys and overviews of the issues that I was talking about or the specific things that were in this talk, um, I'll also point out that um, we have entered a new uh, sort of time in terms of the way that social robotics and socially assistive robotics is being seen. Um, with so many people facing lockdown, so many people trying to work from home, so many people trying to avoid crowds. Um, we're seeing new ways in which uh, socially assistive robots are, are being applied and used. And there's a, an editorial that'll be out in Science Robotics uh, this month um, from myself and Marinel Vasquez talking about some of the different ways that we're seeing these robots being used. Um, and that's a, a short thousand world piece that might be of interest to some of you. Finally, um, I want to just say, um, uh, mention one other project that we have that'll be going live this week, um, which is an attempt to help children, uh, not necessarily children with autism, um, but any child uh, in the age of five to 12, deal with social isolation. Um, one of the things we've noticed is that Teenagers during social isolation do relatively well because just like adults, they're already connected uh, with their friends and with their support groups. They talk, they text, they Zoom, they chat. But younger kids don't. Um, they, for the most part, don't have cell phones yet. They don't have that kind of capability to just sit on uh, a remote call and chat with one of their uh, peers. For the most part in this age group, we see kids who play together and that physical element of play is really important. Um, so uh, we put together a project uh, along with uh, some of the uh, uh, classes, uh, classwork that had gotten uh, shifted and, and postponed as a result of quarantine um, uh, to put together an application where children could use a commercial robot, a vector robot, uh, and a novel application that you can download as of hopefully the end of this week, um, where kids can basically teleoperate uh, and take the role of the robot in some other child's home and uh, play games remotely, play physical games remotely. Um, so we've seen kids as in our pilot testing do things like set up obstacle courses for each other, play hide and seek with each other, um, and have that kind of physical component to play that makes it a social event and a, soci and a socially engaging event um, for these kids. Um, so if you're at all interested in that, that software will be free to download, um, uh, hopefully by the end of this week uh, at robotsforgood.yale.edu. Um, let me just close out by saying thanks to the large team of people that's worked on projects like this and the generous folks who have funded it. Um, and I'll turn it back to Salvatore. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for this presentation and for all your uh, insight. It was very, very impressive, uh, especially the number of hours uh, of the experiments. <laughs> <laughs>
It's very, very interesting. Um, I don't know if in the audience there are some questions. I have a question. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, Brian. It was um, very interesting on two of your topics. Um, Thank you. I'd like to talk about. Uh, uh, the first one is perspective taking, and the second one is joint attention related with the BIM on XT um, uh, paradigm of uh, joint attention with uh, adolescent and uh, autism. But uh, because my main question, in fact, is uh, is about what is a, a social, what is a robot, and what is a social robot. <laughs> so, uh, what are the uh, the basic features that can define a social robot? If you see something, you can say, "Oh, okay, this is a, it's a social robot. This is not a social robot." Uh, and so, I think the two uh, there are some topics uh, that can from my point of view, define what is a, a social robot. I think that the proto-self of, uh, of David, the proto-self, so, so he can recognize himself in, in, into the robot. But this is quite uh, 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 an effect. It's not something that, that, that will be, uh, if you have a, a social robot, so we can have as a result uh, some things related with the proto-self of David. Joan at attention on, on perspective taking, I think that are two very interesting topics for the, um, the social robots. Perspective taking, I did not truly really understand what was your, your paradigm and so on, but uh, uh, perspective taking has some things to, to deal with uh, empathy because you, you have to take the, the perspective of, of others and so on. Yeah. But you want attention, I think it's a very, very important topic because um, uh, you want attention, uh, there is a common object in the attention, the joint attention, but this, uh, this is the object of, of one that will become the object of two persons. So uh, I think this is possible uh, if, if, for instance, uh, uh, you can pay attention to the activity of the social robot. He's doing some things, but because he's in your environment, okay, he's doing something, uh, um, you, you always pay attention and suddenly you say, oh, maybe get some difficulties, maybe he's doing some things that interest me. The two attention will uh, will will meet. So, uh, but this is not uh, my smartphone. It's not uh, a social robot. Yeah. If we agree, so I would like uh, uh, a very interesting about what you can say as so, a specialist of social robotics. So I, I will start with what is a, a joke and then, and then give you a serious answer. I, I often, when I teach uh, AI and robotics, I say to my students, I say, I'm going to teach you a, a topic where I cannot define what this topic is about because I can't tell you what a robot is, I can't tell you what intelligence is, and I can't tell you what makes it artificial. Um, and I think all of those are really true to some extent. Um, but as a serious answer, um, we as humans divide the world into two categories. There are things that are objects and there are things that are agents. And objects are subject to the rules of physics and we un understand that and we expect that. And even young infants have an expectation about the naive physics of the world and how that will affect objects around them. But agents are different and agents somehow obey not only the rules of physics, but they also obey some rules of folk psychology. Mm -hmm. That is, we believe that they have internal mental states. We believe that they have thoughts and ideas. Um, we believe that they have the ability to move on their own. And whether or not these things are actual and whether or not these things are real, that is our belief when we classify the world. 
And so to me, a, a social robot is anything that falls on that agent side of the spectrum. Now, what makes this challenging with robotics is that for most of the natural world, things fall into one category and they stay in that category. A rock is always an object and a dog is always an agent. But robots can move back and forth between those two mm -hmm. categories, right? And at times we can treat a robot as if it is an object. And I'm very happy to you know, pick my robot up and put it down. And I don't care that I put it down where it's face down on the floor. And other times I treat the robot like it's an agent and I feel bad if I put the robot in the closet all by itself. And that change is something that we as a designers actively control. And that's what makes robotics really unique is that we have these systems that can transmit back and forth from being social to being non-social and back again. Um, my group is well known for doing this, not just with uh, low level cues like uh, directionality of motion and uh, you know, uh, inferred goals of motion, but also with high level cognitive effects. My favorite example of all time is uh, uh, robots that cheat at simple games immediately become agents, but only if they cheat in their own favor. If the robot cheats in order to help you win, you continue to treat it like it's an object rather than an agent. So there are these rules, even if we don't know what all of them are at this point, but we as humans operate to divide the world into one side or another. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a social robot is anything that falls on that social side. Mm -hmm. Now you also asked about uh, how do we measure joint attention? How do we measure uh, uh, things like perspective taking. I think these are critical elements for social interaction. We use very clinical measures of them at this point um, because we want to be able to replicate the clinical measures that are being used um, when kids are going in for an evaluation. Um, so uh, the, the joint attention techniques that we use, we give them multiple targets to focus on. We have an adult focus on one of those targets and we see if the child can pick out that same target. Um, for things like perspective taking, um, we literally put a, a barrier, a, a screen in place so that an adult from one side can see things that the adult from the other side cannot. And we ask them, what can one adult see and what can the other adult see? Um, and we have them play those games. Um, so uh, th those are really great, interesting topics. I think I only touched on half your questions, yeah, but, yeah. but maybe it's a good start. No, thanks so much. Thanks sure. so much. <laughs> great. There are other questions here in the in the chat. Uh, Eli Sanubari, do you want to take the microphone, maybe? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is that HLI research like yours has showed benefits for using social robots for neurodevelopmental disorders over and over for decades now. What do you think is the reason that we still don't see these robots in most of the hospitals and care places? Uh, I, I think it's because we've shown the kind of evidence that's compelling to roboticists and HRI researchers, but we haven't shown the kind of evidence that's compelling to clinicians or therapists. Um, you know, when I put a robot with a child and I see their performance go up, I think that's great. What a clinician looks at is they say, yeah, but what are they doing a month later? A month later, are they still seeing performance increases? If not, was it really worth doing that with the child? And really one of the things that we lack right now in this field are these long-term gains, studies that show long-term gains. So in the in-home the in study that we did, we were not able to generate long-term lasting gains without the presence of the robot. When the robot was there, they were doing great, they were improving, but when you take the robot away, those gains go away. I don't think we have anyone who's shown sort of the right kind of evidence at this point. And in large part, we haven't done it because we haven't been able to run these long-term studies. Being able to do what a therapist does is really difficult. Um, I'll tell you, the, 
putting a robot in a home for 30 days and not having any access to it. It's the scariest thing I've ever done as a, as a scientist. I, we were just terrified of what was going to happen because we had no idea what these robots were going to be teaching by day three. Um, and, and that was, you know, terrifying for us. Um, we have to be able to see these systems work over such longer periods of time and they have to adapt. They have to change because we know that kids on this, uh, on this spectrum are really all over the spectrum. They have strengths and weaknesses that are unique to that individual and one size is not going to fit all. Makes sense, thank you. Sure. Uh, there is another question, Nabanita. Do you want to take Hi. the yes. question? Thank you for presentation. So I, my question was, do you have any suggestions for designing experiments uh, for different demographies such as India? Uh, so as we see that most of the studies originate in the West. So is there a way to adapt without reinventing the wheel? Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to answer this again in two ways. I'm going to answer this from an engineering point of view and then from a clinical point of view. Um, so from an engineering point of view, I think a lot of the basics do uh, adapt very well cross-culturally. And most of them have originated in the West, but we are now seeing so many studies that are happening in the Middle East, uh, in China, in Japan, in Korea, in um, uh, I saw studies uh, a few weeks ago from Kenya. Um, we're starting to see these things really start to become uh, global. And I think to a large extent, the kinds of engineering that we need to do, those are universal. The clinical side is much more complicated and the clinical side is more complicated primarily because what constitutes autism changes very much from country to country. Um, we'd like to think that there is one standard for reporting but realistically, that's not true. Um, we know that uh, you know things like uh, the easy to track things like the incident rate. The incident rate in the U.S. Um, uh, is reported as somewhere around one in forty to one in fifty, um, depending on which study you believe. If you go to somewhere in um, uh, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, the incidence rate is somewhere like one in two hundred and fifty. Now we know that that's uh, primarily a, a, a social result. It's not a, a real underlying change in uh, the, the number of cases. It's a way in which diagnosis is performed. It's the way in which reporting is done. It's the social stigma that's associated with it in some places, but not in others. And so finding good clinical ways to span these different areas is very, very challenging. Now, if your interest is just in building stuff that's going to help kids, um, I think that's one place where I think you're, you're probably well off. Um, because for the most part, the things that we learn that are true in one place seem to carry over and be true everywhere. You know, for example, um, I always tell people, the very first thing I tell them is don't focus on behavior uh, directed at the robot. Nobody cares about teaching kids to respond well to robots use the robot as a way to increase their interaction with other people. Okay, that's a simple rule. It's a general rule. It seems to work well everywhere that we've seen it tried. Those are the kinds of things that um, I think will be helpful to you as you look at new, uh, you know, new demographics. Um, but the clinical side of things, that's where you're going to have a real uphill battle because there's, there's just not a lot that any individual can do to, to make that change. Thank you so much. Sure. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe a last question before moving to the to the panel. Uh, I just uh, would like to, to know, um, just for me, it's very interesting, this idea of uh, uh, moving outside from controlled environment. Uh, from your experiences, uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, the real technical challenges uh, uh, that you find you found uh, in terms of like the I can say uh, the socio-cognitive skills that the robot needs 
uh, yeah. what we are able to do and what uh, where actually we still have problems where we are placed. Yeah, so the, the, the short answer is we always need better perception systems, period. Um, perception has been the thing that has, you know, been the, the key to making successful robots has been increases in perceptual capabilities for the last 40 years. Um, every time we get better perception, we were able to do more uh, in more general environments. Um, the, the longer version of this, though, is um, as you move into homes, you face a very different kind of social dynamic than you do in a laboratory. When people come into a laboratory or they come into a clinic, there's a, there's a well-defined social order that happens in those areas with the, uh, the physician or the experimenter sort of at the head of that order and then a well-established sort of uh, expectation for everyone else along that line. When you go into the home, that changes completely. Um, we had one system um, that was a real failure. It was a, a you know, we, we got almost, uh, almost every other system we deployed, the robot was used for 30 minutes every day. In fact, we had to get the robots to shut off after 30 minutes because the kids and the parents would have kept using them for longer than that every day. And we had one system, one family where the robot was used in the first few days and it was never used again. And we went and we talked to that family after 30 days and we wondered, you know, what, what happened? What was wrong? And for the first three days, the, the parents were at home and they were very excited about working with the robot and they, you know, had this great interaction with it. And after the first few days, the, the kids were at home with their grandmother. And the grandmother, who was the real matriarch of the family, the robot had trouble recognizing her face and couldn't remember her name. And she took this as a personal insult. And because the robot disrespected the matriarch in this family, no one was allowed to use the robot. And from that point on, no one else in the family touched that robot. Those little things, those little changes are, they're real. They're, they're important parts of the social dynamic. And we don't think about that at all when we, we're in the clinic. So um, there are some things as we move forward that I think, you know, are, are not just the standard answers of, uh, you know, we need better systems for uh, perceiving in low light and in variable kinds of clutter and those sorts of things. I think there are some real things about the, the social environment that we have yet to, to mention. Thank you, awesome. Thank you so much for your for your response, for your reply. Um, so I think maybe it's time. We are we are really late, but uh, I think because the the subject is interesting for everyone. Uh, so we have our final panel panel session. So I give the microphone to Mohamed and Kerstin that will animate the uh, the panel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am not sure uh, whether I'm a good animator or not, but um, uh, uh, Mohamed Chidwani and myself, we will we will try to chair this uh, this panel session. So the um, the panelists who have kindly agreed to join the panel um, are first of all uh, David Cohen and Brian Brian Casalati, and I don't need to <laughs> introduce them again. You have already heard them and you know where they come from and what their background is and the type of research uh, they are doing. But two of the panelists you, you haven't uh, uh, heard from um, much, namely Aida uh, Zazari from uh, Lux AI, um, a company, and also, um, my pronunciation is very bad, um, Charles Tijoux, uh, is that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that. But um, so I was wondering if the two of you could just for a few minutes introduce yourself and your research and what you are interested in before we join the uh, start the general panel discussion. Aida, uh, would you would you like yes. to like to start? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay. So perfect. Uh, hello to everybody. It's it's great to be here, and then I really really enjoyed listening to everyone and uh, hearing like the amazing research that you have done. 
So um, to give a little bit of introduction about myself, uh, by uh, education, I'm a medical doctor. For several years, I was working as a clinician as well as like working uh, in the domain of like uh, trying to actually see how we can actually benefit in the medical world and in the healthcare world from the advancement of the technology. And then this is uh, almost um, six years, six years and a half that we are actually purely focused on the use of technology and in particular social robots to assist the uh, basically therapy and education of children with a special need and in particular neurodevelopmental disorders. So basically we had this idea to actually come up with some kind of like a software and application and curriculums to support the therapies. But very soon we realized that in order to actually be able to really create like an added value, uh, we need to actually come up with a robot that can also like be a tool that we can really rely to be able to robustly deliver this software and this curriculum. So that's how we actually created a robot called Qt Robot. And then since then, we are actively really collaborating in a lot of research projects and constantly working with the basically end users of the field to actually be able to um, support them in hopefully creating a better educational environment and better progress for the learners with autism. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you, Charles, would you like to uh, spend a few uh, minutes? Yeah, I'm a, a cognitive psychologist, but mainly on uh, cognitive science. And I, um, we, we try to develop uh, cognitive technologies on uh, a lot of smart things, smart things that uh, you can have the concept of smart things as being uh, uh, social robotics everywhere, distributed in, uh, in your t-shirt, in your room, in your home, in the city, and so on. So I think that that more and more we will have uh, 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 things that can be uh, difficult to differentiate between uh, objects on, uh, on agent, because more and more objects will be agents as we discussed with, with Brian. So that's my main, um, my main work. And uh, I work with Salvatore uh, also. We are in the same lab and um, working on, on robots and so on. So I think we are in, in the same, uh, same kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Mohamed, would you yes. like to? Maybe we can start with some uh, uh, discussions and, and points that we can all together discuss. Uh, but by looking, uh, by trying to, to see what has been presented today and uh, the last comments about perception, and, and we have to be aware that uh, we, we are also, um, I think it's uh, nice to have this uh, meeting uh, in ICRA. Uh, so it's uh, it's a very important conference, a very big conference. So it highlights also the importance of social robotics. The, uh, and it has been said that perception and, and so on, they are really important here for, for this kind of robots. But uh, 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 I'm working on, on this topic, but now I'm, I'm wondering uh, if we should not also think about actions. Uh, because when we look to the actions that we are doing with our social robots, they are basically communicative actions. Uh, so we can, uh, you know that there are a lot of debates about, uh, could we use uh, uh, virtual agents for doing the same thing? Uh, probably yes for some of the tasks, but for others, no. Uh, so I don't know how you, you think about that because for, for example, there were a lot of presentation about imitation, uh, joint attention and so on. So they need some, some physical interaction but we we don't use uh, very advanced physical interaction. So I don't know how you think about that. Uh, I mean, all the panel, uh, because it's nice to have clinicians, uh, researchers, but also industry for doing that. What are the needs and the, or there is a need for doing that, or we can still uh, maybe work on social robotics as we are doing now. Mm 
I don't know how you you see that. Maybe uh, Charles or, mm-hmm. or maybe uh, Brian or David or mm-hmm. Alda. I can I can just say a few words. I think you're really right. What about action? On the, but I think action will be related with the autonomy of the of the robot. It must have its own goal. You can, uh, and so maybe we can cooperate. But now the robot, uh, you're right, it's, it's mainly about um, um, communication. So the way we use uh, now, for instance, is mainly about communication. Uh, it's a humanoid, so okay, but, but it's, it's still communication or only communication. This can be done through a screen. Uh, on um, mainly so so so, so um, uh, at the time where um, the robot can have his own goal, I, I, I will do a puzzle. I will solve the, 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 the tower of Hanoi. So by, by myself, uh, also I can ask some help, and I can collaborate with with, with the children or, and so on. I think it's the next. Uh, I hope it's a very, very next future. But you can have also, uh, because uh, we work on a t-shirt, a t-shirt that can uh, uh, tell your, uh, your companion, your, uh, the moods you have, uh, if you are going to have a crisis and so on. So, 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 so this, uh, uh, maybe the, the, the fact that the smart, the smart things, can be your home because it has its own functionalities. Maybe uh, it can be uh, embedded uh, in a, in a goal on some things to do. Uh, when you think about uh, how we are using uh, now, uh, I think it's it's uh, and uh, when you look to uh, to your robot, Ida it's quite similar. You made the choice of not having moving robots, but in fact, most of the robots used uh, are not really moving. Mm. So I, I don't know either how you see that, I mean, in the future, are you planning to have uh, uh, more actions uh, uh, the, or you, you think that it's important now to just to focus on community mm. actions? So basically uh, how actually we see the robot is just a tool to actually facilitate some certain um, basically, um, or for example, like increase the possibility of reaching to some specific goals. So actually internally, how we de- um, basically see the value of the robot is to actually be able to facilitate the uh, creation of certain uh, skills in learners with autism, such as, for example, like communication skills, social skills, emotion understanding skills, and something that actually would support the child to be more successful in the outside world. So it can be the school setup, it can be the work setup, and anything which requires uh, some certain skills related to communication, emotion, and social interaction. So. In this case, there is some um, levels of like uh, physical activity involved, especially like when we are talking about the children who are in the early stage development of their skills. So basically, one of the first things that you require to establish in order to teach learners, regardless of if they have autism or not, is to make sure that these children have joint attention, they have imitation, and they actually do some kind of activities which come from like looking at the others and perform some activities. So in this case, the physical ability of the robot and basically the movement capacity is critical because we need this movement to teach these certain behaviors. However, after this, it's the matter of role of a robot as a interaction partner. So basically the robot is going to be used as a facilitator and a supporter of a human through this uh, triangular interaction to make sure that the child is more collaborative, the child is more open and initiate some things that can be followed by the activity of a human therapist. So personally, in this case, I don't see a lot of value for uh, having a robot which is going to, for example, walk or move or do some more advanced physical activities. That's why at the beginning we create, we basically made this choice that we want to put our effort on 
uh, other things rather than movement, such so for example, like providing a better level of possibility of interaction through, for example, 3D camera, providing a very, very a stable robot that, for example, it can work uh, eight hours per day easily without any kind of like uh, functional problems. And in order to do that, for example, we couldn't have a robot that is like, for example, walking or moving, but be able to have like, for example, eight hours of work. So it's all the time a decision between what is the goal and what is the objective of the robot and what you want to achieve. And then to reach this goal, what are the design basically principles that you have to have in mind and see that what would really contribute in reaching to that goal. So basically that's how we decided to not have a moving robot, but definitely a robot with a, for example, expressive face that can really show an exaggerated and simplified version of like, for example, facial expressions that can be used to teach different variety of social skills, emotions, as well as like, for example, some skills related to imitation of, for example, facial expressions, as well as imitation of like the sounds that come for, for example, a speech therapy and teaching the earlier stage communications to learners. Uh -huh. Yeah, I would also like to um, follow up on that in terms of um, the physicality of the movement, since after all, we know that a lot of education and therapy can be done with a, with a laptop, with a cell phone, with a, or a virtual agent, a screen agent, or a game displayed on a screen. So for me also as a researcher, the, the, the physicality and the potential to move has always been very important but but there's there's also still this big issue of reliability and robustness so for example with the um with the now robot i it is not surprising for me that in a lot of research the the robot is either standing or sitting and i know exactly why because when when we took it um uh, well, it was not for children. It was in a in a care home actually uh, for people with dementia. Um, you know that particular robot is very good at dancing. We know that, but when we wanted it to do some more natural movements like walking, it was falling over a lot. And why? Because uh, the surface the, uh, was quite slippery. Uh, Barnes Casalati alluded to the need if you go out of the lab, you just have to deal with the situations. We could not change the carpet, you know. So, um, so sometimes I would be really, really interested in using robots that have more movement capabilities, but I know exactly that while it would be feasible to do that in the lab under very controlled conditions, where we can engineer these conditions, it would not be uh, 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 suitable for uh, taking the robot out. Or as Aida said, if a person needs to work with it for eight hours and it has to be reliable, and then automatically we are looking at systems with a more reduced uh, you know, spectrum of movements. Uh, Brian Scasellati also with the Jibo robot. Um, you know, there's, there's limited types of movement that can be done reliably rather than the full humanoid, you know, many degrees of freedom type of, uh, type of robots. So um, I just wanted to um, ask a question. Uh, I'm also watching the chat to see if uh, uh, people from the audience have a question. So if you have a question for the panelists, please use the use the chat uh, channel. I wanted to ask about um, robot autonomy. A lot of studies um, with, uh, with children with developmental disorders have setups where the robots are Wizard of Oz controlled or you need another operator in the room, which basically defies the whole idea of having the robot making a contribution uh, in a real application area. Because if you need to hire another staff member uh, to control the robot or to maintain it or to look look after it, then uh, then there is no no point in in using that robot. Um, so there's a lot of research also in the, in this field, our field, uh, on increasing the robot's autonomy. On the other hand, there are also limitations and sometimes there are advantages also in, uh, in terms of how, um, how to involve also 
uh, therapists, teachers, parents, children in the interaction with the robot to also give them some kind of control via interfaces um, with the robot. So I just I just wanted to ask what your uh, the panelists what is what is your general um, idea in terms of how far do we need to push the autonomy and the intelligence, the AI, which is, you know, at ICRA, of course, you know, lots of people are interested in AI. So how far do we need to push that and how far um, can we realistically push it? So I can jump in there. I know Kirsten, you and I have talked about this in the past and we share a lot of the opinions on this. So I'll, I'll present a combined viewpoint here. You, you know, in the early years, it was important for us to have really well controlled experiments just to show that things worked, um, you know, to be able to demonstrate that the robot was actually having some value. We had to run these very tightly controlled, you know, uh, protocols. And the only way to do that was to use Wizard of Oz. But I think the real benefit here is when we can move to autonomy, you know, to be able to, to scale, to be able to reach the number of people who are in need, there's no way that we can do this one-on-one. -on -one. If we could do this one-on-one, -on -one, we wouldn't need robots. Um, it's, you know, we, we can't at this point be able to meet the needs that we have and the autonomy is the only way that that's going to have any kind of solution. So um, if what you're doing is running these carefully controlled protocols, if you're investigating, you know, why do kids, uh, you know, engage with these things, then I don't think there is a need for autonomy. Run the most controlled, mo most, you know, clinically well-designed uh, experiment that you can. But if you want to build useful tools, you've got to invest in the autonomy. So um, we have a, a little bit like a different approach to the level of the autonomy that um, basically it uh, comes from like a variety of like the fact. So um, in uh, based on our experience and what we have seen is that the final and ultimate goal of the uh, implementation of the robot in particularly when it comes to for example like social and communication or skills is actually to reach to the point that the child can generalize their skills so basically there is no point that the child is uh, interacting very well with the autonomous robot but this generalization doesn't happen and what we have seen is the most um, basically reliable way to <clears throat> achieve this generalization of the skill is to actually create like a triadic interaction. So basically in the same time that the child is practicing a skill with the robot, at the same moment we have like a human partner. So it can be uh, a therapist, it can be a, a teacher, it can be a parent. So basically a human participant that immediately child can practice the same skill that has practiced with the robot. So for example, if it is imitating a robot, immediately we want it to start imitating the human partner to actually facilitate this generalization. So at the first point, when we think about like having a fully autonomous robot, at the end of the day, if for the sake of the generalization, we would need a human participant to create this triangular interaction, then this level of autonomy that does not necessarily to be like the highest level um, that uh, is imaginable. The second thing is actually my personal approach that comes from like being a clinician. So I have like a totally background, um, totally different background from many of you. And for me, it's the matter of um, looking at it in a way that at this point, we have a lot of children with neurodevelopmental disorders and with autism that right now they can have a benefit from like working with uh, the technology. And they are actually there. And uh, if we have a possibility to create a little bit of difference in the trajectory of their life by providing a better solution right now, I think it's uh, not the best idea to actually postpone giving it to the hand of like the users to wait until the time that we receive to the, reach to the point that we can have autonomous interaction. So basically how we see it is that at the moment there is some certain level of things that we can robustly without having any error, without having any problem, do it 
semi-autonomously, but in the same time, we can really take advantage from this human partner that we require in the session to support us with a lot of things that we cannot have the direct, um, basically, autonomy on it. And then this is the fact that we have a huge uh, deficit in the autism professionals or professionals in the neurodevelopmental disorders, but in the same time, in a lot of countries, in a lot of um, situations, we have people who are working with children as non-specialized caregivers. So basically by providing a robot as a tool to empower these non-specialized people to deliver a highly scientific and a standard method of practice, basically we are not adding the effort and cost to the system to actually hire a person to control the robot, but we are actually uh, increasing the efficiency of the already existing resources within the healthcare and education system. So I think this co combination of these three points can actually give us a little bit of um, confidence that probably from now and at this situation, we are able to start taking the robot out of like the research, put it in the schools and in the hospitals, but in the same time have a um, basically proactively looking mind to, toward like what can be um, achieved through a better autonomy. And for example, during the R&D in the couple of years, what we can improve to get better results actually. Okay, oh. yeah, thank you. We um, have a point here. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, David. Uh, after we have a few questions, but you can go, David, and after uh, we have a few I questions. Just, yeah. I just wanted to, to add a point, maybe a little bit in between uh, the, the wizard of ours and the autonomies of the robot because i think that there is also uh, the idea of uh, uh, the robot as an assistant not completely autonomous but uh, actually in the scenario that uh, brian uh, presented uh, between the parent and the child the robot was an assistant of the interaction and i think this is an in-between uh, scenario for a clinician that is uh, very helpful in the field of autism and we could add also algorithm, although they are um, not completely available right now, but I guess in the future that if we have an algorithm that can have an ID about certain feature like EEG feature, like a prosodic feature, because basically most of the feature that we use are about movement, at least in the experiments that we, see, we look today. But there are all, uh, other, other multimodal features that would be very interesting in terms of interaction and social skill. And I think that the robot, because uh, it can embody all these features, uh, can have a real impact on the social interaction of a kid with autism. Uh, but again, as an assistant and, a, and as a multimodal uh, agent that can uh, use all this information together. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have one from uh, Rachel. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So, um, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I guess my question is a bit more about um, social robots and emotion. Um, I'm wondering whether in your robot systems, whether you detect and track the emotional state of children with autism. And given that children with autism may have trouble with facial expressions, they may be nonverbal, and they may reject wearing, you know, bio biosensing devices like an EEG monitor. I'm wondering how you attempt to determine their emotional state and whether you think emotion recognition is important. So I assume like it was a question for. I think it's a general question. Anyone can. If you feel confident, you can reply. So actually, um, two years ago, we had a long-term study on uh, emotional ability trainings. So it was a, um, in this study, basically like we had this possibility to actually use the 3D camera of the robot and work on, uh, for example, like emotion recognition and sentiment analysis softwares while working with the kids. But very soon we realized that relying on the on the basically like autonomy of the robot to recognize the emotions is very troublesome because often like for example like the way that children present the emotions is quite atypical. 
So basically they are really trying hard to show a happy face, let's say, but it's a completely atypical happy face. Therefore the robot is providing like a feedback that says that, okay, no, you are not showing a happy face, like try more. And it's extremely goes against like the principles of like training for children with autism because the concept is that you are um, basically um, encouraging the effort that they put and a step by a step you try to actually reach to the perfection of like really showing a happy face. So then in this case, we realized that relying on the software is not going to help the child definitely. So basically we moved it a little bit on the um, side of the controlled by a therapist. So in the same time that they observe the child, they can decide if it is a happy face or not, but also it provides some uh, customization, customization and individualization in a sense that, for example, when the child is in the first session of the interaction, probably like a slightly a smile uh, looking face would be acceptable to provide like a reinforcement. But when you are working in a 10th session on the imitation of the facial expressions, you expect the child to show some social um, advancement. So in this case, the person who is like working as an interaction partner can really know that what is the expectation from this session of the therapy for this particular child and how I can provide a basically um, feedback to the child, which is really like uh, having a training effect and having like a, a skill building effect rather than just something really fixed uh, and not individualized for the performance of each child with autism. Thanks. Someone else want to react on that or about I, I something? Can, hmm? I can add a little bit to that. Yes. Too. The short answer is it's really, really hard. Um, and for the most part, we don't do it very well. Um, and this isn't a problem that's unique to ASD. Even when we look at um, tutoring systems for typically developing kids, um, we see that the kinds of cues that you get are really varied and, and they're very hard to pick up on. Um, Yolanda Light did a great study where she took kids and she was just looking to see whether or not they had become bored with the instruction. And she trained a system when there was one child in front of the robot, and then she trained a system when there were two children in front of the robot. And it turned out to get the exact opposite set of features, um, whether it was one child or two, child, two children there. So all of these little uh, bits of whether or not there's someone else present, whether or not you have an audience, whether or not uh, you feel like the robot is in a certain role or in a different role, all of that will impact the way that even typically developing kids display uh, emotion. When you get to kids with ASD, it becomes even harder. Um, the best thing that we've seen is to actually do two things. Number one, to look for secondary effects, not primary. So rather than trying to read facial expressions, we look at things like, are they starting to take longer to, uh, to uh, perform a task? Are they starting to get more distracted from the, the, the therapy that they're engaged in? The second thing is to look at, the, you know, if you are working with uh, a parent or, or a therapist in the room, to look to them and let them do the management of this. They're going to be better at recognizing this per you know, for that particular child than any system that we're going to build is. And so we actually look for cues from them in order to infer the state of the child. Um, so those are two tricks, but they're not solutions. Great. Thank you both. Okay. There's, um, well, there are actually several uh, questions now. <laughs> there's, um, there's one specifically uh, for David, David uh, Cohen, it's uh, Elham Iravani. Would you like to ask that question? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, then maybe I can I can read the question. Um, it says in most stages of the serious games, I think it refers to what you what, what you um, uh, presented. The monitoring of the child is done by software, and the robot monitors the posture of the child and collaborates. Uh, is that is that correct? Um, moreover, do you also consider? Uh, uh, the children's autism level, like the GAS score in the neural network, which you mentioned. So that was specifically for David. 
Uh, okay, I, I feel I already uh, answered that question, but uh, maybe uh, shortly. Um, we, in fact, in the serious game, I did not detail. We, we had some feature that were uh, register about the pressure, about the tilt of the pen. And we try to adapt the proposal for the kids uh, on the success of the of the child, obviously, to keep uh, him playing with the with the serious game. And regarding the severity of uh, uh, of autism that we used in the imitation task that we had, we did not correlate that because we only used children that were able to do the task. So at a certain level. Otherwise, the, the robot could not learn to, uh, by imitation if the kids is not able to imitate uh, the robot. So obviously, we had a certain level of autistic kids to do the task. OK, yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have a lot of questions, but um, I just like to mention another topic because the, the, the title of this panel was um, perspectives, expectations, and limits of the use of social robots in neurodevelopmental disorders. So I'd like to ask the panelists um, to reflect a little bit on expectations. I mean, in my own experience now for more than 20 years, um, of course, the research is, uh, well, initially it was very difficult to get this work published because uh, everybody thought we are crazy using social robots with children with autism. But now, of course, it's very attractive, not only to funding agencies, but also journalists. And we have lots of media stories. And uh, myself and my team members over the years, we've got many phone calls and emails from parents desperate asking us where can we buy the Casper robot, you know, how much does it cost? Um, you know, it's, uh, and of course the answer was always, well, it's, it's a research prototype and you know, it's, it's not available. So expectations, are we as researchers sometimes raising expectations that we cannot live up to? Because although we have uh, strings of publications, nice journal papers resulting from it, um, how do we actually help, um, you know, parents, um, teachers, clinicians, since the benefit of using robots is not only on the clinical side, it is also, for example, in the area of, uh, uh, the, you know, family life, improving family life, creating scenarios to play where parents and siblings can play with the robot mediating, they can play with with an autistic child. And that in itself, regardless of any long-term clinical benefits is already of big value and parents told me that, I mean, many parents told me they are not so much interested in, oh, have we finished our clinical study? They are interested in, I want that robot, where can I get it? Um, and so, uh, and the same applies to all the other robots that are being used in that field. There are many, many around and they're good, good results. But what about expectations? Are we responsible in, uh, you know, popularizing this idea of using robots for neurodevelopmental disorders and the people who are really desperate, namely the parents, they don't really have access to it. Who would like to comment on that? I, I'll say this, you know, uh, thinking back to a dozen years ago, Kirsten, uh, I, I know how you and I both uh, sort of hid from the media at various points, trying to, uh, you know, keep a lid on stories about this going, you know, uh, viral. Um, you know, our, our worst fear at that point was the headline that said, robots cure autism. <laughs> because we knew that that was going to be the end of our field. Um, and we did, we worried about that. We sat and we talked about this, how can we prevent this? We had journalists who would pop up in our uh, conference talks and we'd have to be very careful with what we said. And, um, and I think we've always, you know, as a field been very sensitive and, and very clear about the idea that what we're doing is research. 
and we don't have a solution right now. Um, I think though that we are getting closer and closer. And you know, the, the thing that I tell families at this point is we don't have something right now, but we're really hoping that we will, you know, in, in a few years. Um, I think we've seen kind of uh, not in the neurodevelopmental disorders area, but in places like uh, more general, you know, tutoring systems and education systems, we've seen that sort of turn the corner. And now it's the case that many of these, you know, great studies that have come out in the last, you know, dozen years are actually turning into good, solid, uh, you know, product and, and startups are showing up that actually are actual educationally valid. Um, I don't, uh, we're, we're small compared to that, you know, larger domain, um, but I think we're a few years behind them. Um, um, we've all also had that experience of, you know, the, the robot companies that will remain unnamed who go out and publish themselves as our robots will solve your child's autism problem. And every time I see that, I cringe. Um, you know, I, I, I love that there are exploratory, uh, you know, things in this space. I love that there are good and well-intentioned uh, startups in this space working hard to make this real product. But for every one of those, we all can name, you know, the one or two that make really over-the-top claims. And we've got to be careful of that. We, we've, you know, our, our ability to go forward and really be helpful on a broad scale is dependent on it. Aida, would you like to maybe comment on that? Yes, of course. So I, I think uh, one of the biggest dangers for the whole field of like social robotics is actually <clears throat> creating expectations which are not realistic and then creating a mistrust. So this is, um, I think something that of course the researchers has been done, I would say much better in terms of like, for example, like the private sector in making sure that the claims are clarified that these are the specific results and this is what we have done in this structure. However, this is very unfortunate because a lot of times we see that the, before even having experience with a social robot in, in real life, a lot of people have created some kind of like a attitude toward the social robots, which comes actually from like the um, fictitious marketing and PR rather than like a reality. So often we see that there are a lot of cases that even without having like a minimum viable product and minimum viable solution, there is some kind of like a very fancy videos coming up that they are showing a robot interacting fully autonomously with children, with older adults, with the members of the family. And a lot of times like the, it creates like two way of um, danger for the, for the whole research field. So the first is that in one side, we have some uh, people who are extremely vulnerable and desperate. So for example, you have a parent who has a child with autism that cannot afford like pay, paying 50, 60, 80,000 euro per year to have like the therapies for the child. So basically they are really vulnerable in accepting like anything as, as a way to, to be able to help the child and they will do it until they have the financial capacity. And then in the other hand, we have like the professionals of the field that they actually judge us based on the claims that we make. So if one day you go and create a video and a marketing material and say, I will cure autism, or I have a product for autism that works for all the children, for all the ages, for all the uh, severity of the autism, immediately they will create a mistrust on you that, okay, these people don't know what they are talking to, talking about. So basically they are not trustworthy. And then I, I'm, I really think that we are in a moment that there is a huge possibility to actually create an impact by having the social robots, but there is a huge danger in a sense that we cannot really like benefit from this possibility that is created and create a mistrust in response of the engagement and attention of the people who are interested in this field. So 
I don't know how it should be balanced out and controlled, but I really think that everybody who actually comes to the field of social robotics, regardless of like being in the academic area or in the private sector and industry, they have to create about like a long-term benefit because like you can claim something and generate a certain amount of like, for example, like financial return in the short term. But if you really cannot deliver what you promise and create added value, basically not only you will get out of the uh, environment very quickly yourself, but actually you create a setback for the whole uh, effort that a lot of people are putting to actually bring a product which is valuable for the end users. Yes, can, can I add something more, more general, maybe not only related to this specific application of social robotics? I, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, in, in some sense, uh, uh, of course, it is also a problem uh, related with uh, companies willing to sell uh, systems and, you know, uh, putting together short video clips which shows that the robot is understanding while the robot is not and so on and so forth. So on one side, certainly there is a, a problem coming from companies. On the other hand, I think we as a community or you know, scientists, we are also responsible of, of what is going on because in some sense we are accepting, I think, too many pilot studies, you know, and, and things that are just, uh, you know, demonstrate that the system is more or less working, you know, while going deep into, you know, the, 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 the experiments like Brian was, uh, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was explaining before, you know, that takes a lot of time, you know, there is a very strong push now for young people to publish. So as soon as they have a superficial result, they publish it, which is, you know, if it's not involved with uh, with the health of people, it's fine because you know you show your ideas and then people start discussing. But if what you show is related with the life of other people, uh, then this is wrong. I mean, how many times you have you have read about uh, artificial retinas, you know, and then people then call you and, and ask where, where they can buy it. So this, I think, uh, uh, we should be more careful uh, as, as a community of uh, uh, roboticists in this case, uh, you know, uh, to educate young people uh, to really, you know, before going out and, and claim something, uh, really have a, a fixed result and not uh, just a preliminary one. So I think we should do that. The problem is this is difficult. Yeah, it is difficult because there is this, you know, this tremendous push to publish, you know, which is uh, in some sense, I, I'm not saying that it is the source of the problem, but certainly it is a strong, uh, uh, you know, you cannot publish a study if you have one subject, you know, even if you claim that it is a pilot study, because then, you know, the journalist reads this article, he probably does not uh, understand what the pilot study means. And then this comes to a conclusion and then they call you and, and ask uh, where they can buy the system. And, you know, this, this is the kind of, of things we should be more careful, not, not only with, the, with this specific topic, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, even with the, with the COVID-19, I mean, I've seen pages of uh, solutions, uh, you know, sold as solutions where they, are, they were just nice ideas, you know, with no trials, with, with nothing behind. This, I think, is, uh, is wrong because the community is introducing a lot of noise and people don't understand what is good and what is bad at, at that stage. You know. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly a very interesting and and um, and important discussion, and it's just everyone just needs to think about this and make up their own mind of where they see themselves in the field. And um, as uh, Julius Sandini said, uh, and uh, you know, we need to we need to publish. Well, I mean, junior researchers, in particular, graduate students, need to publish. So there is this really strong pressure and um, um, it requires some reflection and um, 
collaboration also with other people in order to see what can be done to extend studies maybe beyond the small sample size that a particular researcher has access to, uh, maybe teaming up with other people um, and possibly doing joint, joint studies, um, which would give results that are more uh, more meaningful. But uh, yes, I have unfortunately no solution to that because I cannot stop our, the need of graduate students to publish. It's, it's, it's yeah, we just, we, we just need to try to be responsible and reflect on it and make sure that we are happy with what we are doing and that we can justify it and defend it. And um, so that would be my my suggestion. So we have many more uh, questions, but uh, we are, I think, Salvatore, remind me if I'm wrong, I think we are at the end now of the... Well, yeah, actually, uh, in the schedule, we should finish like 30 minutes ago, but... Oh, okay. Oh, but, yeah, I, yes, I think, that, but, but I think, I think actually, it's, uh, it was a great discussion. So... Yeah, so if, if, you, if you think, uh, if you don't want to add anything... Italian, you know, I'm not very good in keeping time, you know. Uh, no, it's... I include myself in the group, of course. <laughs> no, but, but what I suggest is that uh, we, we are now facing a new way of having conferences. So it's not really finished. We can still discuss. I don't know if you have access to, to Slack, uh, all of you, but it's things that we can maybe continue there. Uh, having uh, yeah. this kind of discussions because I see uh, in the in the, the the conversation that we have here in Zoom, it's interesting. It's starting to have a conversation. I suggest that we we go there uh, on Slack and we continue there because it's uh, quite asynchronous, but it's uh, already uh, useful and helpful for for people. Mm. If you don't have access, you can just uh, ask us and. Uh, we can try to find a solution for that. I give you the stage, uh, Salvo, to... Uh, yeah, maybe we can close here. Uh, I, ju I just, uh, I mean, uh, looking Giul Giulio Sandini just popping up uh, from nowhere, completely unexpected. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, if, uh, let me think about uh, something that uh, more in general we we always talk about. I mean, here we have uh, medicians, uh, psychologists, roboticians, entrepreneurs, and I, I personally think that this is this is the correct way to approach the problem. And uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and and it shows also how much this uh, uh, this domain it's is interesting. It's multidisciplinary and. And uh, um, always used to say, uh, Julio, but also Shiguro Sensei, uh, we build that robot to better understand humans. Uh, we study humans to build a better robot. So I think that this, uh, this, this what we are doing here right now is exactly like it shows in a very plastic way uh, this approach to robotics uh, and why actually I like this, this uh, field of robotics. Uh, because also because the questions that brings uh, with it. Uh, so, well, okay, just 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 this. Um, so maybe I don't know. I, maybe we are at the end. I don't know if there is someone that want to add something. Uh, and uh, because yes, in case, yeah, so yeah, just one thing, please. I really wanted to uh, thank deeply all of the organizers, the panelists, and all of the participants. But I also wanted to stress the fact that, you know what, uh, Kirsten, um, Brian, and some other people said earlier is uh, key. We really need to find a way to bring all those wonderful um, key results to people now. Like here, for example, where I am in Côte d'Ivoire, I work um, in Abidjan, and I went to a center where they take care of children with special needs in general, and teenagers as well. The, the situation there and what the parents live on a daily basis uh, just doesn't match all the wonderful things that are at hand. I know Brian said it's just research. It's true, 
but there are certain things that could already be used in homes. I'm sure of that. And sometimes my thesis directors tell me that, you know, um, I'm very uh, optimistic and ambitious about my thesis results because I'm always stressing on, <clears throat> we want to have something that works for the people. So I was wondering how we could manage. Can we have another e-meeting session uh, with people who would be willing to work on a specific project and have something really live, at least for a small set of families? So actually regarding to, the, regarding to what you say, I. I have a, um, I have a, like a proposal to make. So the a story started here that uh, we actually had like the first at home robot launched about like, for example, almost a little bit less than six months ago. So this is six months that actually we have a robot at home completely like supervised by a parent working completely independently of us. So basically mm -hmm. our role is to actually have like time to time some friendly chats with the parents to follow up and then they often send us some videos to, so, to show us how the child is progressing. But then it, it was interesting because it actually ended up to be um, in the same time as like the pandemic and then the, we saw that in the situation that a lot of children basically do not receive any kind of trainings, do not go to school. This child that we are working uh, with for the past six months, it has like almost like one hour, uh, 40 minutes, depending on the session, like every single night for the past six months. So mm -hmm. now we particularly feel that uh, we are confident in a sense that, for example, by putting the robot at home to be supervised and controlled by the parents, technically, we don't have like any issue in terms of like the implementation. So the robot has shown to be robust to work for this duration. And then it seems that it's extremely easy to use so that the parents who are non-technical, basically they are putting the robot effortlessly in use. So our idea was to actually try to increase the number of like the children about to 30 to 50 uh, children to actually receive the robot and then be able to monitor and see that what would be the outcome when the number of the subject is a little bit more. So since here is a basically perfect place to ask for um, ideas and collaborations, uh, this is the opportunity that exists. So basically we would be really happy to have um, basically all of you on board as collaborators of this project to actually make sure that we are designing a more robust evaluation and uh, a better quality study to make sure that this effort of like putting these robots in the house of the people is diverted toward like a way that we can make the best possible understanding from this interaction and what is happening. So if anybody in the community is interested to actually know more information about like this at home study that we are going to run, we would be really happy to have some kind of like a follow up calls and then have uh, many of you as board as like the scientific advisors of the project or collaborators and so on and hopefully come up with the idea that really can support the further development of um, something for learners with neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, I'm in personally, and you already have my contact. Good. Yeah, I think, I mean, what Linda mentioned, I think, was also about um, whether, you know, we could have another meeting, and this uh, then reminds me that uh, I don't know if um, what Salvatore and Mohammed and uh, Long Chao think, but uh, maybe we could have another implementation of such a workshop, um, maybe yes. at next year's conference or at some other venue. I don't know what, what you think about that. Uh -huh. Yes, that's a good yeah. idea. Mm. Yeah. Uh. And we can ever maybe uh, something that I also like, it, it's, uh, it's not an option. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, we can have both, but something that uh, uh, but might be difficult with the situation that we are facing now, is to have uh, training uh, events because, uh, 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 as it has been said by Julio, it's in, it's important also to train people on these topics, uh, and uh, so that might be uh, some, an option. But I think it's uh, not for this year, or maybe even for the next year, because now we are facing virtual events. But we can uh, organize this kind of uh, events 
in a, uh, in another uh, place when we want. I think yeah. it's where it might be yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep, that's an interesting idea. Mm. Okay, then that, shall yes. we conclude now yeah. by thanking everybody, all the speakers, panelists, organizers. Uh, oh. I, I didn't do much work, hardly any work. So I would have to give credit to Sal Salvatore in particular as as well as um, Long Chao and, and yes. Mohamed. So, um, oh. but I would also like to thank everybody attending, discussing, making suggestions, and sorry that we couldn't answer all of these questions that came up in the in the chat. But as Mohamed suggested, we can move to move to Slack um, and continue that. Salvatore, final yeah, comment. Just... <laughs> yeah, I just want also, I mean, I need it. Uh, thank you, the ANR and the Foundation, and the, uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation for, uh, for make this possible. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there is a nice idea from Linda. Maybe we can uh, have like a kind of picture all together. Uh, <laughs> we can have a, a kind of snapshot. Yeah, maybe something like, okay, if- It's fine know, if every, everyone, yeah, okay. If everyone wants to turn on their, their camera. Great. <laughs> and that's great. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's, okay. Okay. Cheese, one. I will put them in the website. There are others. Oh. Yeah, other people. Wow. Oh. And, and something Jeez. that is very good. OK. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. OK. OK. See you soon. It's like a bye bye. 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 Okay. bye. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Well Thank done. you. Thank you, thank you.